Hello and welcome to Bobsha's Crafts. Today we are going to be making Jigglypuff. Yeah. The link to this pattern will be found below and it is a really nice Spanish lady on YouTube that did the original video. I did make some modifications and changes to the pattern however because when she did hers uh, she did not do continuous rounds so there was a step up and crease lines on the main body and I also made some some slight modifications to some of the embellishments. This particular Jigglypuff was made with a four millimeter crochet hook. And Her body is approximately four inches in diameter and that doesn't include her legs and arms and ears and her little puff at the top. So let's get started. Supplies that you're going to need are pink yarn for Jigglypuff and this one I found uh, in a bargain bin at I believe it was Joanne Fabrics and this is a, a four a medium four okay and then my favorite brand is or one of my favorites is Kieran Simply Soft and this one again is a four um, it does require a five millimeter crochet hook or that's what it suggests but you do not have to adhere to that and this color in particular is dark sage and then last we have Karen Simply Soft's black and again this is a number four this is a uh, black noir and uh, next we will need a crochet hook um, number four is what I used for that jiggly puff, but for this video I thought we would try something a little new and I am going to use a three millimeter crochet hook just to see what the size difference is and also I like a little bit of a tighter stitch throughout my pattern so we're going to try that out today. You will also need a needle and this is basically used to sew on the arms and legs and the puff at the top and the microphone when you're done. This particular brand is Chibi. I got this at Michael's or Joanne Fabrics, one of the two. You'll need scissors. You will need what I like is lots and lots of yarn scraps. Those are usually my place markers. Or if you want to get really fancy, you can go out and buy place markers. There's all kinds of different ones. We will need filling. And this particular one is polyfill. And this is basically used to stuff the inside of Jigglypuff and all of her different uh, arms and legs. You will need a hot glue gun and hot glue to glue on the felt. And as far as the felt, we will need red felt, pink felt, white felt, blue felt, and black felt. Okay, now those colors, you don't have to adhere to them. I have seen Jigglypuff in, um, with, with green eyes before. Um, as far as the green yarn, I've seen her microphone tip in gray. So experiment to your heart's content. Okay, so we have finished up round five and we have 30 stitches. It ended on the increase and we are starting round six. 
So for round six, we are going to single crochet four and then increase. And we should end up with 36 stitches by the end. So we will single crochet one, put our stitch marker in. And you don't have to use a stitch marker. You can actually just count around to 36 if you are really good and can keep up and you have nothing to distract you. Um, but with my experience, the minute I do not use the stitch marker is when somebody calls or somebody knocks on my door or somebody walks in the room. So I tend to always keep some kind of marker to mark where I was last. Just a helpful hint. So we have one single crochet, two, three, four, and then we are going to increase. And you'll start to notice your work will take on almost a um, hexagonal shape as it gets larger. You'll have like a side, 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 You'll start to see that, but that's okay because in the long run, it still comes out as a circle. So go ahead and continue around with round six, um, single crocheting four and then doing an increase, and I will meet you here at the end. Okay, we have reached the end of round six. We have 36 stitches for round seven we are going to do another increase. So this time we will single crochet five and then increase. And we should have 42 stitches at the end of this round. So we will S single crochet, oops, single crochet one, put our stitch marker in. two, three, four, and five. I can kind of tell this is bargain yarn because it's giving me a little bit of a hard way to go. And then increase. One, two, three, four, five, and increase. Okay, so I've just done two of those, and you'll want to continue around, do four more, and Count your stitches, you should have um, 48 stitches there, sorry, 42 stitches at the end. And I'll meet you back here for round eight. Okay, we have just finished up round seven. We are heading towards round eight, and I just wanted to add a quick note. Um, a couple rounds ago when I said, oh, I'll just add the stitch at the end, it really doesn't matter. That's one thing I, I love about some of these um, amigurumi patterns is that they are very forgiving. Now, there are some instances where you do have to keep your stitch counts, and it's very important. But when you're making a ball, a general rule of thumb for me anyway is that if I miss one, add it in. It's not a big deal, as long as there's not something important coming up to where you'll notice that in the pattern. For this one, you won't. Okay, so heading on to round eight, we are going to single crochet in all 42 stitches around. And that's uh, as simple as it is. I could sit here and bore you and walk you through counting to 42, but I will spare you that. And I will just show you one single crochet two single crochets and 
three single crochets. Go ahead and finish up to the end to your 42nd stitch and I will meet you back here for round nine. Okay, I've just finished up round eight and I have 42 stitches and as you notice, it's starting to curl in. Just push that the opposite direction. That's going to happen no matter what. Um, you just want to make sure you're working on the correct side of the work and how you can tell is you'll see the circular pattern opposed to the little dot pattern on the inside. <clears throat> For round nine, you are going to single crochet six and then do an increase. And this will happen six times for a total of 48 stitches. So we will single crochet one, place our stitch marker, two, three, four, Five and six, and then we are going to do our increase. That basically just means two single crochets in the exact same stitch. That's the increase. Okay, so you're just going to do that all the way around. Single crochet six, that means one single crochet in each stitch, and then in the seventh stitch you are going to do two single crochets for your increase, which will leave you with a total of 48 stitches around, and I will meet you back here for rounds 10 through 19. Okay, we have just finished up um, row nine, and we should have 48 stitches around. Obviously my work keeps curling in, but that's okay. It will do that and just straighten it back out. Um, so next, for the next 10 rows or rounds, you are going to single crochet continuously around. And that's it. You just do that 10 times. So you'll go around this entire round, and that will be round 10 and go continuously around, that will be 11. So let's go ahead and get started with that. First, what I like to do is I like to put a little piece of yarn in here just so that I can mark my place. I don't have to count so many hundreds of stitches around. I don't have to keep moving my my little uh, placement marker and then losing track and having to count how many rounds up I am. I just place a little piece of yarn and I go to it. So we'll do one. Now I'm just going to take you through the first round. Two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. 13, and I don't even really need to count these, 14, 15, 18, 19, and 20. Okay, I'm just going to share my little life hack here. I have my my little bowl. I stick my, my ball of yarn in it so that when I'm pulling, my yarn ball doesn't go everywhere. That's my little life hack lesson for today. Okay, we're going to go ahead and continue around. And for those of you who don't know what a Jigglypuff is, that is a Pokemon. 
and if you're not sure what Pokemon is, well, you're probably my age or older. <laughs> um, Pokemon is a cartoon, and its most famous character was Ash Ketchum, and his little buddy, his little sidekick Pokemon was Pikachu, and the basic premises of this was that you have to gotta catch them all, Pokemon, you gotta catch all the Pokemon. That was one of the goals, and the other goal was to, my husband's laughing at me over here, the other goal was to basically battle and make your Pokemon stronger, and this was the premises of this cartoon. Um, then they started out with like trading card games and I think it might have actually started out as a trading card game. I'm not too sure about that. What do you think, honey? Uh -huh. <laughs> and then, um, then they got in with the video games and obviously you had, um, I think it was red, blue, yellow, crystal, so on and so forth, black and white and they had all these different Pokemon games, and it basically evolved from there. And then they had uh, Pokemon XY, and then a bunch of Pokemon movies. So if you don't know what a Pokemon is, but you think they're cute, and you kind of like anime or cartoons, then I would, I would definitely recommend watching it, especially if you were born in the 90s. Okay, so we have just completed round one. We are going on to round two. I just placed my little piece of yarn, and we will start into round two. And then once you get to round 19 and you have finished round 19, I will meet you back here. Okay, we have finished up uh, rounds 10 through 19, and... I uh, have my little stitch marker, so we have uh, round 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. And we are getting ready to start into 20. Um, for 20, we are going to basically do the opposite of what we started with. So we're doing everything in reverse. Row 20, we are going to SC6. Let me just grab a little... Uh, stitch marker here just to mark my spot. Okay. So we have a little one. Two, three, four, five, and six. Now we are going to do an invisible decrease. So what I am going to do is just zoom in. Okay, and how you do the invisible decrease is uh, you'll see one, two stitches. You are basically combining these two stitches into one. So if this is the outside of my work and that's the inside, I am going to take my needle instead of going through both stitches, instead of going through both stitches, I am going to go through just the front loop of one and then the front loop of the second one. Grab my yarn, pull it through both loops, and then just continue on like you would with a with a normal like single crochet. So that's the invisible decrease. We'll do that one more time. So we have one, two, Three, four, five, 
and six single crochets. Oh, I lost it. Where are the... Okay, now we have six single crochets and we're going to do our decrease. Let me just center on the camera here. So we'll go through the top of the first stitch. You can see where I am. I'm not through both of them. I'm just through the front loop only. And then go through the front loop of the second stitch. And that's it. One more time. One, two, three, four, five, and six single crochets, and then our decrease through the front loop. And that's it. So for this round, for round 20, you are going to be going from 48 stitches down to 42 stitches. Now we've already done three of these. We're halfway around our work. You're going to do three more on your own. I will meet you back here for round 21. Okay, we have finished up row 20 and uh, we have 42 stitches. So the next round is really easy. All we're going to do is single crochet and all 42 stitches around and I will see you back here in a moment. Okay, I am finishing up round 21. It's just the single crochet all the way around. And that's it. Okay, round 22, we are going to single crochet five and then decrease six times for a total of 36 stitches. So I'm just going to add my, my little place marker here. And we have one, two, three, four, five, and then our decrease, which remember will be through the front loop only. So we're going to combine these two stitches into one. So you'll do that. Um, all the way around approximately five more times and you should end up with uh, 36 stitches at the end. I will see you back here in a moment. Okay, we should have 36 stitches. We just finished row 22 and we are going to round 23 now. So we're going down one. We are going to single crochet four and decrease around. Um, six times for a total of 30 stitches. So again, I will just take you through the first one and then meet you at the end. So we have single crochet single crochet one Two, three, four, and then do your invisible decrease, combining two stitches into one. So just do that all the way around, and I will meet you here at the end. We have just finished up round 23, and we're moving into round 24. This one we are decreasing again. We are going to go from our 30 stitches that we have down to 24. And this is going to require you to single crochet three and then do your decrease six times. Okay, so we have single crochet 
One, two, three, and decrease. So you're just going to do that continuously around and you should end up with 24 stitches at the end. I'll meet you back here shortly. Okay, at this point we are going to just pull out a nice large loop so we don't lose our space. Check our stitch marker so it doesn't fall out. And we are going to grab our stuffing. Yay! Now this is the, the fun, messy part. Ooh, lots of stuffing. Let's see, we don't need that much. Okay, we're just going to start stuffing our jiggly puff here. And I'm going to throw in some of this, these yarn scraps. So I do have quite a few of them. We'll save a couple. Okay, I'm just going to throw in, let's not do the black ones. Sometimes the black will show through the pink. So I'll just put those aside. Okay, throw in some yarn scraps. And more stuffing. And it, it just depends on how big you want this stuffed. If you want it nice and full or just a little bit stuffed. Now my first one I made that was like this, this um, four millimeter, see the large holes? I overstuffed it and those holes were just really stretched. So I understuffed this one this time just so that it, the holes wouldn't, you wouldn't see the stuffing through the holes. This one, I think it's safe to say I can really stuff this sucker nice and big because those holes are very tight. And I'm kind of finding that I'm really liking working with a three millimeter crochet hook a little better than the four for certain projects because um, you don't end up with those big holes. But then again, it could just be this yarn because this was bargain bin yarn and it's not what I am used to using. So we're just going to stuff, stuff. And we can add a little bit more stuffing in a bit. Just try and get a nice round shape and you'll, you'll play with that a little bit later just to make it a nice, nice round ball kind of shape. Okay, and I think we're okay right now. Yeah, this yarn's very, very fuzzy and kind of hard to work with. So it works. It's just uh, not what I'm used to working with. Okay, now we are moving on to round 25, which is very easy. It's just a single crochet two and decrease. And this is where it gets a little hard to uh, crochet once you have the stuffing, but it's not that bad. So we have one. I stitch marker in because I am, I keep losing track of my count. Two. And decrease. One, two, and decrease. And what I'm finding out about the amigurumi is, believe it or not, even though there's a lot of original patterns out there, um, the same basic principles pretty much apply as far as your counts and how big you want your circle and everything's just pretty much about shapes and circles and tubes and 
So that kind of helped me learn this a little better after I got to doing so many projects. I um, I kind of got the hang of it and things just kind of flowed from there. So hopefully soon here, after I get through a couple more projects, I will start developing more of my own patterns. I already have one or two of my own patterns. I'm not too sure on Creative Common licenses. So... I'm not sure what I can put on YouTube. I would imagine it would make somebody angry if they had a pattern that they're selling on Etsy and I decided to do a crochet video. So those I will just show my finished product and give you links to the actual Etsy um, pattern or the... Oh, no, I got two stitches left, so that means I I missed something here. Oh, this yarn is so hard to work with. Okay, so at this point I am supposed to be ending up with 18 stitches, and like I said, this is pretty darn forgiving, but I'm going to try and keep it correct here. So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 14, 16, so I'm on track, 17, and we got two stitches left, so we're just going to, I don't know if that was my mistake or if that's just a mistake in the pattern because I was translating from Spanish and well, I I don't really speak Spanish too well. I try for work, but I don't speak Spanish too well. So we have 18 stitches now. I add a little bit more stuffing. I'm just going to keep adding as we go because that hole will eventually get too small to really stuff this. It's always easier to do it while your hole is still, still a little on the bigger side. And by the time we close that up, that should be pretty good. Okay. Okay, so we are done with round 25. We have 18 stitches. We're moving on to 26. Let me just get my stitch marker out. And 26 is SC1 and decrease, so we single crochet one. And decrease, single crochet one. And decrease, single crochet one, and decrease, single crochet one, and And stay on camera, decrease, there we go, single crochet one, oh, and not, and decrease, Single crochet one and decrease. That worked out quite well. 
Okay, moving on. We are now done with round 26. We should have 12 stitches. I'm pretty confident about that. And we are moving to 27. So for 27, it's just going to be decreased six times. So we'll do. Number one, decrease number two, decrease number three. Six. Okay, now what I will probably change on her pattern, I'll take that out, is normally I will take my, my little thread needle and once I get down to uh, 12 or so stitches in order to avoid this little bump here or ridge here, I usually will just take my needle and it leaves just a more finished look to it if you um, use your needle and go through. But at this point, let's go ahead and cut a tail, nice, nice size tail, just a couple of inches or um, six to 12 inches long. And we're just going to Pull it right on through. And this is pretty darn close to finished. I think we could just pull on it. And we will thread our needle. And remember, if you're making this for kids, you don't want to skimp on the sewing and all that because you know this is going to have to get washed. You know that it's, you know, it's going to get dirty. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm going through each of the little uh, front loops, kind of like we did the decrease, but I'm just doing it all the way around. This wasn't in her pattern. This is just usually what I do to finish something off. So not only is it uh, the tighter work, but it's, um, it's more secure for, for when kids are playing with it. They like to stick things in their mouths and all kinds of fun stuff. Okay, so now that we have that done, I'm just going to take my needle and go through the uh, go through the work and secure it. There we go. Go through the center, secure it again. Okay. And if it's for an adult, it's just going to be a show toy. You could probably just hot, like go through and hide the yarn through the work, like like so. And that will actually hide your your yarn. So you could just go through your work like this and hide the yarn. But I suggest if you're making this for a little child, you leave the long tail and then when you get to the point to where you're going to attach uh, your, your puff at the top or a leg, you just bring that yarn through to wherever you're going to attach something. And I'm just going to assume right now that my leg's going to go right about there. Just remember, don't pull tight because you will indent your work and you don't want that. Let me just pull that out because I'm just trying to show you for an example. Okay, and we'll just leave that right there because what I'm going to do is when I do attach whatever I do attach, um, 
I will knot together both of the yarns to kind of secure them more. So not only is it sewn through here, it's weaved through the middle and it's going to be attached to another part. So this I could probably, you know, um, throw it in some wool light and gently wash it. Obviously we don't want to throw it in the washing machine if you're gluing anything. Um, but if you hand crochet the eyes and stuff, it should be fine. Just make sure everything's securely attached for the little ones. So we are now done with the body. Yay. Okay. Now, next part is going to be ears. So again, we will still need our pink yarn. We'll st still need our little marker. And um, I will meet you back here in a second. Let me just clean up my mess. ears we are going to make a magic ring so we will hold our tail of our yarn and our three fingers and wrap it around our pointer finger two times back over the front once back over the front twice and off the finger and you test this by basically just adjusting that loop and seeing if the tail is the part that moves okay so we are good here and we are going to start by um, single crocheting four in our magic ring. So to start off, you obviously can't single crochet right off the bat. I never count this first stitch. That's basically just to secure it. And then we have one, two, three, and four. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and close our magic ring. Like so. And again, I always think of my granddaughter and I always think she is going to rip this thing up. So I always and you don't have to. I always put a knot in the end just to secure it a little more tightly. And I also weave in my tail as I go along. Now I don't always weave in the whole tail, but I do weave in the tail. So for the ears, we did our magic ring. We single crocheted four. And according to her original pattern, she said to close the ring with a slip stitch and make a chain in the ear and then go on to your next round. But we are going to change that because we are going to work in the round. So for round two, we are going to increase four times, taking those four stitches to eight. So basically, we're going to do four increases. One, two, three, four. We have one, two, Seven and eight. Okay, that's round two. We have eight, eight stitches. And for round three, we are going to just single crochet in all eight stitches around. 
And like I said, I am modifying this pattern as to be done in the round, so we're going to skip some of those other instructions. So I'm just SC around eight times, and I'm just going to flip. My work is kind of bending in towards me, so we're just going to flip that around so we don't get confused and end up working on the inside. So, one, two, three, four, Seven and eight. Okay, we are now done with round three. For round four, we are going to do a single crochet and an increase all the, all the way around, and that will bring us to 12 stitches. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, increase. At this point, you should have twelve stitches. That is round four. Round five, you are just going to single crochet around in all 12 stitches around. So, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, and 12. Now this is where I'm going to do a quick count just to make sure that my stitches are on track. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Good. 
and that was round five. Round six, we are going to single crochet two and then do an increase four times. So one, two, and increase. One, two, and increase. One, two, and increase. And two. Now at this point we should have 16 stitches. And the next two rounds are basically going to be single crochet all the way around. So we should do 32 stitches all the way around. Okay, we now have 32 stitches. We have reached the end and we are just going to take a little bit of our yarn here, approximately 12 inches, cut it and remove our stitch marker and just for safe measure, I am going to slip stitch this last one, and that's something that I just usually do. There we go, pull it nice and tight, and we now have one ear. So you'll want to go ahead and do a second ear on your own, and um, next we will work on hands.
Well, if you've made it this far, we are now working on the hands. So we'll take our yarn, tail end, and hold it in our three fingers, wrap our yarn around our finger, and make our magic ring. And we are going to single crochet, crochet six in the magic ring. So we'll just... I always do my first stitch, that doesn't count, that just kind of holds it in place. And we will single crochet one. Two. Three. Four. Five and six. Okay. Now once we have that in place, we will decrease our hole on our magic ring just by pulling that tail and trying to get that hole as small as possible. And this is the point where I just tend to knot mine so it doesn't come loose. Make sure I got enough leeway on my hook. Okay. Next we are going to just uh, single crochet all the way around in each of those six stitches. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. Three. Six. Next up. Next up is to do a single crochet increase, making those six stitches into nine. So we will do that next. Single crochet. It's one. Two. Three in the same stitch. Four, five, and six in the same stitch. The smaller it is, the harder it is to work with, I think. Seven. And the last one. 
we will have eight and nine. Okay. I'm just going to turn this the correct way so it's a little easier to work with. I don't know why they just always tend to roll in the wrong direction. Okay, now that we've done that, we should have our nine stitches. Um, the next part is pretty simple. You're just going to single crochet around for rows four through seven. So that would be four times, four, five, six, seven. So that's it. One, two, three, four, five, Seven, eight, nine, ten. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17, 18, that's two rounds, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, that's 3. Eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, and thirty-two, thirty-three. Four, thirty-five, and last but never least, thirty-six. And just as I always do, I just slip stitch that last one. That's not in her instructions. I just do that. But almost everything I do. Pull that yarn through. Pull it taut and. I have two hands. Next we will work on feet. Okay. 
We are now working on feet. And again, just like always uh, for this pattern, we make our magic ring. And we are going to single crochet six in the magic ring. So we start off with our just first stitch, the one that we don't count. And one, two, three, four, Five and six. Okay. Now we will close our magic ring by pulling the tail. Make our knot. And you don't have to knot it. I just do. Make sure that's going to stay nice and tight and not come apart. Okay, so for um, round two. Round two, we are going to single crochet all the way around once. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Okay, let's turn this on the right side. Okay. Now for um, round three, we are going to single crochet and increase three times for a total of nine stitches. So, single crochet. Single crochet and increase. Single crochet and increase. That should be nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now for the next round, we are going to single crochet all the way around for uh, rows four to nine. So 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So six times we're going to want to do that. And I will meet you back here. Don't forget, you will need two feet, so you'll have to do this twice. Okay, here we go, and we are back to work again. We are now working on the toupee, and starting with round one, we are going to do the magic ring again. So again, with those last three fingers, grab the tail of that string, wrap it around your finger twice, back over front, back over front, and off the finger, and as long as when you pull that short string, that, that, uh, ring closes, you're in good shape. And if it closes by pulling that one, well, we did it backwards and need to do it again because I've done that before. Okay, here we go. We are doing a toupee. We are starting six SCs in the magic ring. So as usual, I am just going to put my stitch there. Oh, oh, hold on, wait a minute. Ha <laughs> ha, I thought that was the end out of the bowl, and it wasn't. It was part of all my ears. Okay, let's get that extra yarn out of the way here. Got all my tails everywhere. <laughs> so you're probably ahead of me by now. I'm waiting and saying, what the heck? Come on, let's move it. Okay, there we go. Okay, now let me catch up to you for a change. So, make one of these, and 6SC, one, two, three, four, okay. Five and six. Okay, there we go. And now you probably have done this, but go ahead and grab your little knot there and pull your tail taut and make your little knot for the little ones. And make sure that you have enough of leeway on your hook because nothing's worse than making it so tight and struggling with that first stitch. And that knot doesn't have to be pulled real tight, just because it'll get pulled as you're working on your yarn. Okay, so we have the six. Let's check that. Uh, next, we are increasing six times, so 12 stitches. And then if you want to work ahead of me, round three to round eight, you'll go ahead and just SC in all 12 stitches um, for six times. And that would be, you know, each round would have 12 stitches and you do that six times. So that's if you want to work ahead of me. Okay, so now one, two, three, four, five, six. Here we go. And who knows, I might just fast forward through some of this video and just do it on like speed play. Okay, so there's my one. Two. Oh, this yarn's horrible to work with, guys. I am so sorry this is going so slow. Usually when I use my hair on Simply Soft, it just, it's a nice, smooth, easy glide. The yarn is soft and silky and cuddly. And this is not wool. It's got to be some kind of weird acrylic because when you buy them in those bargain bins, it's sometimes they just come with ba in a bag and you don't know what the weight is. You have to actually guess or count the threads. And... You just don't know what you're getting. There's like, no, this is the name brand. This is what kind of yarn it is. It's just yarn in bags. 
and sometimes you can recognize some and you're like oh my god I know that that yarn goes for like seven bucks usually let me get like three of those <laughs> so I might end up with like three Totoro's or something because I got a lot of the Totoro yarn and I got different kinds too just so I could try and see does he look better like with the wool with the real fuzzy fuzzy um fur like in the movie when she like runs up to him and she like falls asleep on him and he's like just soft and fuzzy and furry but then like when he's standing in the rain and obviously you're wet in the rain but when he's standing in the rain uh, okay so that should be my 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Beautiful. We are moving on. Let me check off my things that I've gotten done. So we are on uh, round nine and we are going to SC increase six times around the circle for a total of 18 stitches. So we're going from 12 to 18. Now let's go ahead and do a quick count, make sure that we have 12 stitches still because I wasn't counting, I was listening to my talk. Uh, let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, and twelve. Beautiful. Okay, stitch marker out. And then a lotion on my hands. I have to lotion. They're getting dry from playing with my yarn. Way too much because it's winter time. Okay, so there's my SC, and then I am increasing. Still hard to see these holes sometimes. And then SC, and increase. Try and start making them a little loose at this point so you don't end up with a, a real tight um, top of the puff because she doesn't explain that. And I'm actually thinking about modifying this pattern again just to make um, just a little bit more of a step up from the bottom to the thick part because it just, it's hard to turn it because it's so hard. So... I was even thinking about maybe a um, adding in a pipe cleaner. It would be easier to bend the pipe cleaner into that shape, like double it up, fold it in half, and twist it, and then just uh, bend it. So that would retain its shape a little better because trying to sew it in place, like, oh my gosh, it, it, it trying to get under there, it's, it's very complicated right there trying to sew it. If I had a pipe cleaner, it would just kind of stay there and I could just do a quick stitch here, a quick stitch there, and all would be good with the world. So that's my new idea on adding onto this pattern for the toupee. I'm going to write that down. So a little star and try pipe cleaner. 
then I know I can get that anywhere. Okay, I think that's it. And we should have 18 stitches. I've noticed with her pattern, like uh, a lot of patterns, they, um, they have a nice step up. Like you know if you're always supposed to end on a, a double stitch, you know. But then, because this one's always a single, if it's a double or whatever, increase or decrease. But um, hers doesn't, the numbers don't match up correctly. And I'm thinking that might be the oddity and the shape of this, is that they're not, uh, they're not following a, like a, a precise mathematical equation, I guess. Like some of the other amigurumi patterns, like you go from do 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 do, like from three to, to the, from three to six to nine to, and you increase evenly the stitches around. It's a little bit more math, but um, that's I like that, and I don't know what that's called. If that's like Japanese amigurumi, because it's more mathematically based than the, the ones, the patterns that I find here. There are more pattern, kind of like, it looks like a crochet pattern, but eh. I, I, there's just differences. I think I like the math aspect more because it's just, I don't have to think about, I know my mathematics tables, my times tables. So I find that quite easy. Okay, so we have two, Four, six, eight, ten. What do I do? My oh, I think I added in my increase. Let me see where I am. I should have eighteen stitches. This looks like more. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. Okay. 18, so right there, and these, oh, that's not so fuzzy, oh, so fuzzy, okay, I just want to make sure, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17, and make it 18, just one in here. Yeah, I think I increased or something. There we go. Okay, so we are at 18 stitches. Well, mine's done. And rows 10 through 18. You're just going to single crochet all the way around. So it's like from this point, it just gets, you're doing the same amount of stitches around. It just kind of gets bigger as you, as you go. So you can do that and um, meet me back here for the microphone or hang around and listen to my uh, Dharma talk. not as this is where I am now, but aspiration is really, uh, and that's just one, I mean, that's what the Buddha offers. I'm not saying that's what one's aspiration should be. It's unique to each of us. But the sense of is holding out that as possibility. To me, when I feel like I'm just, you know, spinning in my stuff, or I'm on retreat, too, and, you know, there's times on retreat where you're putting one foot in front of the other and going, why? You know, what has this got to do with anything? Okay, okay, awareness of sensation, awareness of aversion, okay, you know what? And just for... <laughs> <laughs> reminding myself of that potential of aspiration and as Ajahn Buddhadasa said in one of the uh, you know we mentioned him before there's a, a well-known in, uh, in English speaking countries a translation of one of his talks which I couldn't find but it's long anyway 
but called Nirvana for Everyone, where he was giving a talk to Thai people and talking about how, this is in the 1980s, 1990s, he died in the 1990s. And he was talking to Thai people and kind of lay people and saying, you know, it's come to be believed that Nibbana, freedom, is either just for very rare monks and nuns or something that only happened back in the old days. And it has nothing to do with people now, you know. It was a nice idea, but, you know, forget about it for us. And he's saying, no, Nibbana is for everyone. And so just the, really the short synopsis, Nibbana means cool. He's saying it's that state of heart, of mind, that's cool from the freedom, from the coolness of no kalesha at that moment. Just a moment, and sometimes even Upandita would talk about momentary freedom, a moment of where we just touch the sense of what's possible when there's a, that real steady mindfulness awareness without any clinging or aversion or me, 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 and we have moments of that. Just moments where we get a glimpse, even so Buddha Dasa calls it, okay, that's a momentary sense of the coolness of heart, mind, free from Kalesha, but with mindfulness, wisdom. And he says we all have many moments of that because we couldn't survive without it. You know, the fire of the Kalesha is the burning of clinging and wanting and aversion and the endless, seemingly endless, but it's not me, me, me. Have you noticed how exhausting that is? How sometimes it really does feel like a fire. And the, there's just the sense of ease, of peace, of coolness, really, when that's gone. Of course, it is from really hot countries where coolness is more a sense of peace. I know in Barrie right now in Massachusetts, you talk about the coolness that might, might not be the best uh, simile. But anyway a sense of the ease, just noticing that, touching it, but thinking this is the potential for everyone. So just to bring it into the realm of reminding us why the Buddha taught, why we all are continually inspired and motivated to spend our lives both practicing and sharing this because it's like such an incredible possibility for each one of our minds and hearts and for the world. So this sense of aspiration, talking to someone today, that's aspiration, um, not a one-time decision, but a really uh, incredibly supportive and onward-leading aspect of um, our path of our whole spiritual practice, which is really the path of our whole life, not just about a meditation retreat. So I'll just say a bit what, about aspiration. And the difference between aspiration and craving, desire, you know, we can often get confused between those two, of course. So aspiration as a wholesome sense of our deepest motivation, our deepest, really deepest purpose, and, our, and I'm talking now in terms of our, our life, in terms of our awakening heart and mind, so from, from this aspect, it could be many things. But it's a wholesome factor. And you can feel, one can feel, when it's the wholesome aspiration, it has a quality of, of uplifting our energy, supporting our energy. It, it brightens our heart, our mind. It gives a sense of, ah. like, so for me, when I read that, what I just read from the Buddha, if I if it tunes into aspiration, it's a sense of, ah, you know, inspiration. An in-breath, filling the body, filling the mind, the heart with life, with possibility. You can feel the wholesomeness. And it gives the, the faith, the confidence, the energy to do, really, the energy to drop into the next moment with total commitment, basically. But how it can shift, of course, to greed, to wanting, and at times it will, it'll feel really completely different because the, the attention starts to get focused on the result. 
you know. So hey. aspirate. Boy, this just rings true to my life lately. This this is this is uh, like my passion, something that I can send into and think about things and this is my meditation time if I'm not sitting or doing yoga or something like that. But um lately it's felt like such a burden and I just want to get this is my attempt to get back to my sanity is uh the black one. There we go. I don't like using black because sometimes when you use whites with blacks or like pinks with blacks, you get the fuzz afterwards. But moving on. Anywho, I had so many toys and scarves and sweaters and hats and projects that I've done that were sitting upstairs in my uh, my one of my craft room, like my craft room upstairs, but it's way too cold in the winter to do any crafts in there. So that's why I want to get my other room going here because that is going to be my actual craft room. So we can do something like make the upstairs a guest bedroom or even if we keep it just as my sewing area, like half of it, and the kids' play area is the other half, that's fine. I keep all my yarn boxes under the bed in there, but I just want to get cleaned out, and I want to get all my bins and boxes organized in the closet down here and have my paints in here and not have to run up and down the stairs. So that's what I've been working on, but it's so much stuff. I... You know, I was talking to my husband, and he said, well, Chris, you know, once we get that room done, you know, you'll, you'll have some room. I said, you don't understand. Like, there's no room upstairs. I need to, I mean, I really need to start selling some of this stuff again, because I, I do it in spurts. Like, when I start getting too many things, I, I just either gift them or, you know, or gift them to people at work or friends and family and then like if I still have a bunch left I'll stick them on offer up or whatever the website usually it's offer up I'll stick my stuff let those okay it just it seems to have issues it crashes a lot and I don't know it's just it's kind of wonky how that one works so I think I'm liking offer up a lot better because it's this isn't like a business to me and I don't want it to be. I learned that real fast. I had a, all those toys and scarves and all kinds of stuff and man, I was just selling them left and right like all the stuff and um yeah, I made money, but then just having to keep up with, like, I'd be sitting here trying to crochet and relax and do my toys and zen out, and all of a sudden I get doop, 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 doop on my phone, and I could not get off of my phone for, like, three or four days straight. It was a little nutty. I just, I could not wait to get back to just doing something. So, I have some things, whatever I have on offer up, I have on offer up. But, um, yeah, I don't want to experience that again. That was horrible. I had so many things I, I put on there because I needed to just clean out that room so I can start getting things ready for my room down here so it's not overcrowded with things. And, um, yeah. Sales is not my thing. <laughs> I'd be cool on like a talk show. Like, kind of like Rachel Ray. She's kind of real. I could be a Rachel Ray, a Zen Rachel Ray. <laughs> Although my life is local. Okay, so let's get back to this Dharma talk. I'm like starting to zen out again, just following my stitches and thinking. Okay. 
We're going to do some fun stuff with her. I'd like to get pink, like pink yarn with like that sparkly stuff in it. Like this, I want to use this for her microphone. Oh, the color doesn't come out. The color is actually, because I have this video, is not showing it right. Um, fuchsia. It's like this beautiful hot pink with little sparkles in it. I, I just love it. And this is not here in Simply Soft. This is a, a Red Heart. Uh, let's center. Here we go. This is a With Love Red Heart. And it's soft, just like the Karen Simply Soft, but has the sparkly stuff like the party yarn. And it was a little pretty penny, but I got it with uh, coupons. I saved up all of my coupons. I was like the crazy coupon lady. And uh, Joanne Fabrics, because if you don't know, Joanne's takes their coupons, but they also take everybody else's. Um, Michael's, I think Hobby Lobby. Um, I don't know if they do pack of tans, but I know they definitely price match with Michael's and Hobby Lobby. So if you ever want to go on their websites, check out their prices and then you know, try and, and figure out where would be the cheapest and then add up all your coupons that you can for Joann's and then you will uh, be able to get some yarn that's really expensive and although, I mean, it's pretty expensive yarn, but it's not like break the bank yarn. Um, I, I want to say it's like between five and eight bucks, I think. I'd actually have to look on the receipt because there were some that I bought that were like $10 big bulky like things of yarn and gray and stuff so for my Totoro. So I want to uh, I want to try and catch these deals. <laughs> these are the deals I need. Okay. Anywho, I'd like to find that in a very light pink sparkly so that like when she's on stage I can't show the background of her being on stage and singing, or but uh, I want to make her sparkly. I think I'm going to change this a little bit. I have some ideas. Okay. Sharing thoughts. Moving on. Dharma talk. is for a complete awakening, and that can be really inspiring, uplifting, energizing, brightening. And then another time I could read this, but the, the mind, the heart is a little bit, or, or a lot, <laughs> colored by greed or self-hatred and not quite seeing it. It's like, well, that's just hopeless. You know, that's impossible. How far am I from that? Oh. Really far. And then you start the comparing comes in in the sense of looking, you know, one eye on the goal or both eyes away from here. And it feels different, way different. It can be frustrating. It can be demoralizing, or you start, you know, making the checklist. How much more do I have to do? How far have I gotten? You know, but it's a, it's not. And I'm there. And on the bleeding state is a, a suffering, confused state. You can flip back and forth. Gil Fronstahl was writing a little bit about it. I like the way he described this. One way aspiration becomes craving is through expectation. Right? Okay. I've been meditating. How far along am I? Have I gotten there yet? Am I first stage yet? Let me make that, you know, through expectation. At its best, aspiration has an openness to possibility without a need for anything to happen. That to me is like the most succinct, beautiful explanation. An openness to possibility to the vastness of possibility without a need for anything to happen. See how it's that's the practice in a nutshell. This does not mean that we do not act on our aspirations, but that we do not cling to the success, to the results. There is something wonderful in a healthy aspiration that is not dependent on outcome. So that's not something we can just own, but I'm just saying it to drop into our hearts and minds. You get the sense of the difference for the aspiration is, yes, and it's not dependent on outcome, but it gives the energy, the determination to simply 
take the next step. So the sense of really what's true for each of us, our deepest aspiration, motivation, I found for myself and talking and reading to a lot of other people too, it's not so much something that comes through thinking about what it should be, should, as soon as there's a should in there, it's not really quite the thing. But I found that the, whatever the deep aspiration for you tends to arise in an intuitive kind of way. Like I feel it could come up in my heart, mind, often in the silence, in the stillness of heart, a contented mind. That can happen on retreat, doesn't have to be on retreat. But not when we're in the midst of trying and wanting and comparing and doing, but just there's a stillness to get more in touch with ourselves. And I'm sure many, if not all of you, are familiar with that. And what it is for yourself could be whatever it is to cultivate um, compassion, to completely awaken, to whatever it is, to be a better person. There's no right or wrong about this. But taking... Uh, from time to time, taking the time, or just having it in the back of your mind to have a sense, notice if and when something like that arises, and to not let your your little personality kind of trap think, oh no, that's not possible for me. Who do you think you are? This is an ego trip. You know, when the really the vastness, powerfulness of a of a deep aspiration arises. So say, take what the Buddha says, uh, this unshakable heart, mind. Say that arises as an aspiration. Like I know in my mind, it's quite could be quite possible. The next thought is, yeah, right, fat chance, you know. Or yeah, you think so? Yeah, look, who do you think you are? Maybe the Buddha. That's just the old habits talking. Blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much. It's just thoughts are... Okay, now I believe I have reached the end of 18, row 18. So let's just count. So we've got uh, do, 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 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Yes. Now we are done with the toupee. Let's get these out. Just pull gently. This is Karen Simply Soft, so usually it just glides out, but this is fuzzy yarn, acrylic or something. It just wants to hold that, like... Good, no black. Okay. Okay. Now, we're just going to slip stitch. Ah, booger, booger, booger. Okay. We're just going to not that slip stitch and pull off a pull off a tail because you're gonna need plenty to uh, plenty to sew with and pull that and that's another thing this one doesn't glide through it's there we go very fuzzy it's like having my cat right here or something. Okay, and then we will go to the next video, which will be the microphone, which I am doing a little differently because I am just a fantabulous person and love sparkles and shine. So I'm going to change to Glade Puff's microphone a little, but you are welcome to use either that gray or green yarn, which that still looks, uh, that still looks really, where's the middle of the camera here? I need to zoom out. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Well, that might even help when I want to keep my hands on the table. Okay, so the green you could see looks just fine. Um, gray would look just fine. It's still cute. I I just need to change this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna add a little uh, edging around this microphone because it just it doesn't look right to me. Um, I don't know. I just don't think it looks right to me. So I'm going to make it look more like a microphone, not just a log in the hand that kind of has a tip and the handle's not really skinny. I mean, it's 
a it's a graduation, but kind of looks like Jigglypuff's gonna club somebody. To be honest, it's shaped like a club, so we're gonna try and make that look a little bit more like a microphone. <laughs> Okay guys, time to zen out. This is the video you want to skip if you don't want to listen to a Dharma talk and just do the rounds together. Go to the next video and I will show you what to do um, for the next round. If you want to work ahead, it's going to be an SC decrease for round seven three times which will leave you six stitches. So you would be going from your nine stitches you're at down to six stitches. So you'll do a SC decrease, SC decrease, SC decrease three times. And then um, for six stitches. But what you want to do, and this is uh, where you'll want to watch the next video, is... I'm going to show you how to do your yarn color change, which she didn't show you how to do a good yarn color change in her video. So um, she just joined them with a slip stitch, chained one. So uh, I'm going to do a smooth transition one for you so you don't see the steps. And um, if you want to stick around or just fast forward to the next video, that's where I plan on picking up with the SC decrease three. Okay, let's see here. Now we are going to send out the heart with life with possibility. You can feel the whole things. And it gives the the faith, the confidence, the energy to do, really the energy to drop into the next moment with total commitment, basically. But how it can shift, of course, to greed, to wanting, and at times it will, it'll feel really completely different because the, the attention starts to get focused on the result, you know. So maybe the aspiration is for a complete awakening, and that can be really inspiring, uplifting, energizing, brightening. And then another time I could read this, but the, the mind, the heart is a little bit, or a lot, <laughs> call it like greed or self-hatred and not quite seeing it. It's like, well, that's just hopeless. You know, that's impossible. How far am I from that? Yeah, really far. And then you start, one. the comparing comes in and the sense of looking, you know, one eye on the goal or both eyes away from here. And it feels different, way different. It can be frustrating. It can be demoralizing. Or you start, you know, making the checklist, how much more do I have to do, how far have I gotten, you know, but it's a, it's not an inspiring, on the leading state, it's a, a suffering, confused state, you can flip back and forth. You tell me. I was writing a little bit about, I like the way you described this. One way aspiration becomes craving is through expectation, right? Okay. I've been meditating. How far along am I? Have I gotten there yet? Am I first stage yet? Like, okay, just a quick note. Um, beautiful yarn. I think uh, it's just grabbing the needle a little bit. I'd like it to be a little smoother, um, more sil just a little silkier, kind of like the Karen Simply Soft. This is, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. It just, my stitches are going to be tight and that's, that's fine. But just that, just a side note for those who are curious about the sharing and how it performs or how well it crochets in the different projects. Um, this would be good in a larger gauge. I think it would slide a lot because it seems to slide pretty good. Just I think a larger gauge needle would be a good project for this yarn. 
but the hat or scarf knitted won't be bad. Okay guys, that is round. Oh, almost there. Oh, I pulled out the stuff. Okay. That is round three. I'm going to do round four, five, and six. Okay. Just wanted to show you how that's done. Just keep going around for three more rounds. Okay, you know it your expectation. At its best, aspiration has an openness to possibility without a need for anything to happen. That to me is like the most succinct, beautiful explanation. An openness to possibility, to the vastness of possibility without a need for anything to happen. I'm working on it. Is thus the practice in a nutshell. This does not mean that we do not act on our aspirations, but that we do not cling to the success, to the results. True, true. There is something wonderful in a healthy aspiration that is not dependent on outcome. So that's not something we can just own, but I'm just saying it to drop into our hearts. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop this and we are going to continue because we just finished our, um, our round three, four, five, and six. We are now moving on to round seven, which is that SC decrease I was talking about in the previous video. Okay, moving on. I'll stop this for those who want to skip ahead and I'll meet you back here. Okay, guys, <clears throat> we are in the home stretch. I need something to drink. Oh, my word. Oh, um, my part of water bottle. It was making this weird sound every time I tried to take a drink, so I just changed the filter. And I noticed on the back of the box, it says, uh, the Brita bottle, bottle, and I was trying to figure out the black stuff. I think it's charcoal that's in there, if I remember. Um, but I don't, I, I couldn't remember what the heck was the black stuff. I think it's charcoal. But I was trying to find out what it was. And I, the first thing I come across is the Brita bottle filter is not intended to purify water. Do not use with water that is microbiologically unsafe or unknown quality without adequate disinfection before or after the sun. And I'm like, okay, well, I usually use this to filter. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, boy. Okay. Sorry about that. Um... What does it mean it doesn't filter? And I'm the weirdo that believes that, like, I'm worried about fluoride in my water and all kinds of weird crap because gases and all that fun stuff. I don't know what they put in my water. I like buying bottled water, but this saves me money. So, and it's good, easy to take the work. But it just reduces chlorine taste and odor. And then one filter can replace 300 plastic bottles, and that's the next reason why I did it, because I felt I didn't want to keep polluting the earth. Hey, it was made in Mexico. Yeah, I wonder what Trump would think about that. <laughs> okay, moving on. Sorry about that. I hope I didn't offend anybody with my thoughts. It's just a... Uh, a joke. Okay, so we are done with that. We are on round seven, and we are doing the SC decrease three times, and we are changing to black. So let's get our black ready. Get my little scraps out of the way here so they don't stick to it. And again, that would be Karen Simply Soft. Okay, get my black ready. 
Okay, so we are going to start out with uh, one SC. And a decrease. And I, again, I'm doing this a little differently than she did. She just did a, a quick yarn change, and there was like just it was too obvious. Come on, it keeps sticking to the tinsel. Okay, now what we're going to do is an invisible decrease. We are going to set this yarn back here, and no, I will not knot it in the middle because with my luck <laughs> with my luck okay it's gonna be like this that's gonna be behind there and this is gonna be kind of laying on the edge okay so we'll go and do our next SC Oh, it didn't. Did it go through both? No, it didn't go through both. I thought it was really loose. Okay. This tiny work just kills me, man. It, it kills me. Oh, I didn't get it in there. I did a good one. Okay, so I'll start it here. There'll still be enough stitches. Let's tuck you on the other side of that. Let's go over the top of the microphone a little. Okay. Oh my lord, Chris, please get it together. What am I doing wrong? Oh, doy. I have to go behind the yarn. Oh. Okay, guys. Bear with me here. I'm a little slow. It's like 2.04 a.m. And this is the life of a third shift worker. So... Before I forget... Yeah. Okay. Decrease. Come on, get over there. This is so hard for me to finagle. You should see those little tiny arms and legs. Oh my gosh. Those are rough on the hands. I have to do the, the stretching exercises. And the, and the <laughs> yeah, we all know that symbol. Star Trek! Nanu Nanu. Okay. So that was a decrease. And. Too many years of doing this and enjoying it. I'm going to probably have to get gloves soon. Oh, guys, you get, you're probably going a lot quicker than I am right now. I keep getting caught up on this tinsel. Okay. Let's more. Sorry, it's so quiet, guys. I need I need to get background music or something. Now. <laughs> we just finished that. Okay, and we have... Oh, I'm sorry. You know what, guys? Hold on. Yep. Messed up. Sorry. I'm going to get in that. 
those two loops. I didn't mean to pull through the pink yarn. I to pull through the black, black yarn. Okay, there we go. Now, this pink tail we're gonna cut just a couple inches. And we are going to now lay that pink tail in there. The black tail can get stuffed inside. Just be really careful with that because you know where you ended. So take your marker out so it doesn't snag on the stuffing. And this black yarn can get stuffed inside. The stuffing that should hold it nice and tight because it's through, you know, all those stitches. Because <clears throat> you don't start stuffing now, it becomes a problem later. There we go. And stuff the microphone. Do, do, do. Oh god, now I got that song stuck in my head. I am really going to stuff this sucker because I really want this to be big compared to the bottom. I think the way that top sits. I want to take a little piece of cardboard and just so it kind of sits flatter. Because microphones aren't really shaped like a dome. They're kind of, there's a flat part to the top. Ooh, I know what I could do. Be stuffing. Okay. Oh, wait. Where are we doing SC decrease? So I have one SC. Now I'm going to do decrease. I try and hold my stuffing in because if you start pulling stuffing out, Sometimes there's always a little fuzzy spot there. Okay. This is the decrease. And I'm just running that yarn right down the middle so it's being hidden underneath that black. That one down there a little. I don't know why I did that. Okay. That's still not good. It's going to decrease. Guys, we are in the home stretch here. All we have to do after this is sew this puppy together. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Add our embellishments, sew, sew her together, and hopefully she will be pretty and sparkly and look like a singer. And I will post a pic so that you can see all the different ones and what their sizes look like with the different uh, yarn needles and with different embellishments that you can think of or you know jigglypuff doesn't have to be plain in fact i'd like to do her in like just a pink a real light pink glittery yarn that would be pretty it'd be like star quality star power okay this is where that knot is this is I'm going to hold that in the back because we really don't want this knot coming through. Oh, come on now. Okay, and this should be our last stitch. Oh, okay. I'm making mine. Okay, this is my. Okay. This is my change, not hers. On this round, she had to SC in all six stitches around for like five more rows. I'm decreasing mine because I'm going to put a little band around the top of the microphone. I'm changing that and I'm changing this part of the pattern. So. For round seven, you'll do the SC decrease three times for six stitches. Then you will 
you know, changed your black color in that round. Make sure that you stuff the microphone. And then you will do another, this is where I need to put my little arrow, another SC decrease. Okay. And then you will have, I boy, this looks like a mess to me. I don't like working with black thread because I, black is very hard to see. One, two, three, four, five, six. It should be six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Okay. And then um, what I am going to do is uh, for 8 to 12, or now it wouldn't be 8, that would be 8. Okay. Uh, for rounds 9, we'll do 9 to 13, 9 to 13. We are just going to um, SC in all six stitches around for five rounds. So I am going to zen out at this moment. We are about 18 minutes into this video. And I am going to stop this right here because the next video is going to be me zenning out doing this because it will take me a while. This is so small. So if you'd like to just listen to the rest of the Dharma talk with me, that would be great. If not, skip the next video and move on. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that, but you'll figure it out. Once you hear the Dharma talk come on, you're going to be like, oh, okay, this is the one I skip. Okay, so this is the video you want to skip because it's going to be the Dharma talk and this will basically be rounds 9 through 13. So we have 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. That would be five of these puppies. And one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, I will insert this right there. And we'll start our uh, Dharma talk. Nope, oh, it's reloading. Play talks. There we go. Carol Wilson. You get the sense of the difference for the aspiration. Is that, yes, and it's not dependent on outcome, but it gives the energy, the determination to simply take the next step. So the sense of really what's true for each of us, our deepest aspiration, motivation, I've found for myself and talking and reading to a lot of other people too, it's not so much something that comes through thinking about what it should be, should, as soon as there's a should in there, it's not really quite the thing. But I found that the, whatever is a deep aspiration for you tends to arise in an intuitive kind of way. Like I feel it could come up in my heart, mind, often in the silence, in the stillness of heart, a contented mind. That can happen on retreat, doesn't have to be on retreat. Mm -hmm. But not when we're in the midst of trying and wanting and comparing and doing, but just there's a stillness to get more in touch with ourselves. And I'm sure many, if not all of you, are familiar with that. And what it is for yourself could be whatever it is to cultivate um, compassion, to completely awaken, to whatever it is, to be a better person. There's no right and wrong about this. But taking uh, from time to time, taking the time, or just having it in the back of your mind to have a sense, notice if and when something like that arises. And to not let your your little personality kind of trap 
think, oh no, that's not possible for me. Who do you think you are? This is an ego trip, you know? When the really the vastness, powerfulness of a, of a deep aspiration arises. So I take what the Buddha says, uh, this unshakable heart, mind. Stuffing so that arises as an aspiration. Like I know in my mind, it's quite could be quite possible. The next thought is, yeah, right, fat chance, you know. Or yeah, you think so? Yeah, look, who do you think you are? Maybe the Buddha. That's just the old habits talking. Blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much. It's just thoughts arising. But the sense of the, the power, the depth, the, the, the beauty of whatever the aspiration comes for you, I think it's, I feel it's so uh, uplifting, onward leading, and important to, to honor that, really, to let it in. It, it's really beyond the personal, you know. It's the personal that thinks, oh no, it couldn't be possible. But that quality, whatever it is, comes up. You just just let it in, let it sit there, and as best you can, just honor it without without putting it down, without going into personal stories. And sometimes the the aspiration can be inspired. Like for me, it came from sometimes from reading the Buddha, but what really and sometimes it comes from talking to someone else who's experiencing inspiration or hearing about someone else. So I just want to share a story um, of a woman, because this is actually what made me want to talk about this tonight. This is some days ago I was talking to a friend who, a long-term meditator, practitioner, and she has been involved for many years in what's called the Tibet Oral History Project, which is run, which is um, involved in interviewing elderly Tibetan refugees just getting into these whole stories of their lives. Some of them were up on the web. And, and she had we had talked, she told me about this some years previously and had shared a particular story which she'd actually sent me the, the whole interview. But anyway, when we were talking the other day, and she just kind of burst out again saying, and, and talking about practice and just talking, was like she remembered this woman that she interviewed Jang Chuk Palmo. And uh, really, the depth of her wisdom and the simplicity of her kindness and love and, and caring for everyone around her and the incredible suffering she'd been through and practice in her life was so inspiring to my friend. Remember, my friend had met this person in person just uh, a few years ago. So this is a real-life person, which sometimes is so much more juicy you know, you think, well, the Buddha, okay, but 2,600 years ago, maybe, you know, things have changed, like Buddha Dasa was saying. But the, so the profoundness of the depth of her wisdom and what she'd gone through, and here she is sitting in this really loving, simple person, caring for everyone, she said, I really inspired me. Why settle for less? Now, you can Why settle do for less? crochet you know, this whole thing really and then stuff it so at the end. Want, it's so, because that inspired just me. as so she inspired easy or hard, but I just like to stuff as I go. Brief synopsis, tell a story. The story. I mean, so I'm not trying to shove it in there. Cutting it down. But I'm trying to shape it a little better. So Jang Chuk Palmo, um, when she she was born in Tibet in 43, to a nomadic family, but also fairly well to do at that time. And when she was about 15, and after the Chinese had been in um, the country for a few years, but then when they started to really destroy the monasteries and such, she and her family and village were all trying to flee to India, as so many did. And they got involved in a firefight with some of the Chinese army. And so many, most of the relatives she was with, her parents or siblings that she was with, were killed. And she was shot. She had like several bullet wounds in her legs and arms. She was 15 at this time. And so she was captured and taken. It really wasn't to a jail camp, but to sort of a, sort of like a house arrest, you know. And they took care of her and, and took care of her wounds and all. But she was so determined she wanted to escape so that she could practice the Dharma. She'd come from, her family had been really quite religious, quite involved with uh, uh, Buddhist practice and knowing many um, mamas. And, and she herself was quite spiritual from a young age. So she very much 
uh, couldn't practice and she wanted to say prayers for her dead relatives and just basically practice the Dharma. So a couple of different attempts. But anyway, finally when she was 16, she's 16 years old, and she'd more or less healed her leg wounds, she managed to escape with one other person. This is in Tibet, like in the winter. And they managed to escape and flee. And I mean, it's a whole long story. I'm cutting this short. Through the winter, falling in icy, in icy ponds, not having any food, going off for passes, running into also other, like one woman who took them to her house and completely gave them food for the journey and ways to carry it so people who would support them. And they finally managed, they managed to escape, she and this other woman. And they traveled for one year, one year, and they got to Mount Kailash. One year, walking around Tibet with nothing, escaping from the Chinese. So they got to Mount Kailash. And when they got to Mount Kailash, then she began really to want to do practice. And her, her friend was saying after a while, you know, I, it's too much. I'm too cold. There's not enough food. I really can't stay. And she said, of course, fine. Go on your way. Oh. But she really wanted to stay at Mount Kailash and practice. Now she's, what, 16, 17 at this point? So she starts doing full-length prostrations around Mount Kailash, you know, <laughs> going on and on, taking, you know, weeks and months and just storing a little sampa. And then, you know, doing prostrations, going back and getting the food. So she's doing this, just living in caves for some time, really trying to purify her heart and mind and so she can say prayers for her dead relatives and all. And at this point, she said, she met um, a couple of lamas came, you know, realized beings. And they came and... Um, were talking to her and saying, you know, what are you doing? And she was describing her practice and how she was trying to practice, you know, to be enlightened and also to say prayers for her parents. So the lamas, she said, I felt agonized by the thought that the Chinese had caused us suffering and killed without reason, yet I continued to practice. And so the lama was saying to them, well, how do you perceive the Chinese? And she said, well, to be honest, I perceive the Chinese as enemies, you know. It caused me so much harm, and I believe that they're enemies. And he said, well, you are doing a great deal of practice, but, you know, it's necessary to have love and compassion. And if you continue to perceive the Chinese as enemies, this does not conform with the Buddha Dharma. You really will never achieve complete enlightenment as long as that's how you are perceiving the Chinese. And so, you, see, you, see, you know, her lamas tell you, if you practice this love and compassion, the Chinese, the enemy will not be the enemy, but like your relatives. If you can love the enemy without any degree of difference, if you can do that, if you can learn to feel no difference, this is what you need for practice. So she, of course, had great faith, you know, and she'd been brought up in great faith, so she really took it in, and she, she, you know, really vowed to this Rinpoche, yes, I really will really practice, I want to do this. So she's staying now in around Mount Kailash for years and years, practicing, just living in caves, there's nowhere else to live. And she said, I put in tremendous effort to learn. I, I practice again and again really hard. I exercised again and again, even while eating. And finally, with the Lama's blessing and doing pilgrimage and prostrations around the mountain, meditating and putting in every effort I could, really focusing single-mindedly on this, this coming to you know, love and compassion. I couldn't do it for almost two years. Because so I'm thinking I'm, I'm only two years. <laughs> she couldn't do it. It improved a bit, you know, that she could improved a bit, then a little bit more. But the thought kept returning, you know, the thought of the Chinese as enemies. So I kept practicing while at Mount Kailash. You know, we think, 
you know, I think, I don't know what you think. I think, you know, okay, I've been doing metta for a couple of weeks, you know, and I still don't quite love myself. You know? <laughs> so, so she spent at least seven years there practicing, 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 you know, with this sincere devotion. But hey also guys, this is the last basics. one. How do you find the energy? How do you find the determination? How do you find the inspiration to keep going? So that's what inspires me. So she said, I lived at Mount Kailash for many years, practicing Dharma. There was no place to sleep except in caves. And so the interview is asking her, she's living, been living in, was living in the States for many years at the point of this interview. And the interviewer says, if one practice, um, after spending seven years, can you help us understand what did you come to understand from that? And she says, if one practices diligently, it certainly is possible to realize enlightenment and help the sentient beings. And those two are like conjoined, you know. So, skip it. Okay, I'm um, sorry that video cut out on me. Let's see. Thus, this is the reality of trying to make videos. But I like making videos because at least I get to work. I don't like the selling part of it because then... You get a million emails and stuff like that. So subscribe. Let YouTube make me a couple cents or something every month. That might help with the cost of the supplies. That's why I'm starting to sell these now. As After my videos, I just like sell them or gift them. Because, um, and I thought about, because I do do the Pokemon Go. Yes, I'm a Go Grandma. Um, only at, but not so much in the winter, more in the summer. So I'm trying to make sure this is really firm so that the microphone doesn't bend. And I made sure I had like two or three stitches left before the end. And we've been stuffing as we've been going. You can stuff at the end. It's just doing that a million times. So... It just seems to be more time-consuming that way instead of just stuffing as I go. So helpful hint for those new crocheters out there that see Jigglypuff and say, Oh my god, she's so cute. I gotta make her feel free. And like I said, I will post um, the YouTube link for the Spanish pattern for those of you who are trying to learn Spanish like I am because I want to be able to communicate with my patients that are Hispanic or Mexican or because I it's so important it's when you can even if it's a couple words and then you kind of tell them that well, I don't speak Spanish but if you say in Spanish I've got to draw your blood or I have to check your blood pressure actually May I please check your blood pressure because the way most of us Americans say it in the hospitals, it's more of a demand and not a, not an informative way of saying it or a pleasant, like, asking permission, you know, like, por favor. It, we don't add that on the end. And that's important. It shows respect. It shows that you're... Even if you don't speak, though, because sometimes they'll just start rattling off in Spanish. You don't know what they're saying, and they're going way too fast, especially when you just are starting to learn words and sentences. And I'm starting off with medical sentences, things that I can use every day. Because me learning how to go, how to say, oh, where's the bathroom, that's not going to help me. I need to ask somebody to go to the bathroom and pee in a hat and give me a urine sample, please. And... And I don't want to seem like a demanding person. Okay, so we're going to just be really careful. Make sure you stuff that stuffing down because you don't want little fibers sticking out. And this is the other thing I worry about with kids. Like, always read your polyfill. Don't just stuff it with just anything. Um, yarn scraps are good. Usually yarn, they expect, the baby brands especially, they expect kids to be putting yarn in their mouth because you make clothes. But... Just watch your stuffings and what you're making with, like me with the hot glue gun. Oh, 
I would love to crochet the eyes and all those fun things, but okay, that's really, really, really stuffed. I don't want the white to show through the black. Let's see if I can move that around just a little bit in there. If not, then I can push some out. Let's see if I can uh, pull that out so I have that loop big enough so it won't come out. And I'm just going to play with this for a moment because you really don't get the... Okay, yeah, that's... I don't like those big white dots. We're going to have to take out over stuff the bottom. So we'll just take some of the bottom out before we close this up. I have to just work it through. There we go. I need my forceps. <laughs> this is... Okay, so don't over, just overstuff the top of it, not the bottom of it. I thought the yarn was going to cover that up. But it's it's a number four, but I'm also using a number oh, a number three hook. So the stitches are tinier and tighter. But this polyfill is white. I need black polyfill. That's what I need to do. I need to figure out, there's got to be a YouTube video for that. I need to figure out black polyfill. I could dye this stuff. Probably make a fortune if it hasn't been invented. I'm going to look that up on Amazon tonight. <laughs> I always come up with these weird ideas and then like I just think, oh, someone has, has had to have invented that already. And I would like to buy it. So for these projects here, just to have the black for my darker colors, I don't want the white to show through. And then I could overstuff it and it, you won't be able to tell. Let's see here. Ugh, messy stuff. Okay, that's looking good. We're just going to finish off with our slip stitch. Try and make sure all those little silly fibers are off. Oh, I wanted to slip stitch. There we go. Pull that out. Okay, and we don't have to have a severely long tail, but I'm thinking at least six inches because we're just going to pull that all the way through. And I don't know how easy or hard this is to see. And I'm hoping I'm staying on frame. Okay, so we have that. Now we're going to grab our chibi needle. Our chibi, chibi. What these little things are. Give them some black eyeballs. Chibi. The little baby versions. Okay. There we go. Beautiful. Now, this is where I need my stitch marker because I am. It's so hard to see what black. I don't know why. It's just absolutely horrible. Hard. Okay, that's the stitch before my knot right there. Because what we are going to do, and this is going to be so hard for you guys to see, is we are just going to sew around. So, and this is something else that she didn't do, but I do this. There we go. Put my hands up here. Okay. Uh, how close I can zoom in. That's really close. Holy camoly. Oh, my nails are horrible. A healthcare worker. Constantly washing my hands. My hands look like I'm 60. Okay, so the next stitch over from your hook, you'll see it. You're going to stick your crochet, your uh, needle, sorry, in through the front loop and come up in the middle between the actual stitches. So I'm hoping that you can see that. It'd be like going through the front loop. One. Two. 
to three. Four. Oh, a little fuzzy. Got two more to go. Just going in front of it. Five. And the last one is six. And I just put my stitch marker there because then I forget where. I left off and I go around too much. Not that makes that big of a difference. So, um, let it zoom in. Just pull that nice and tight. And that will hold. No need to knot. I'm still getting stuffings out. Make sure you retract the lead on your pencil before doing this. Okay, and then we are just going to go up through the top. I like that we did that pink throughout too. It made it thicker. It definitely gave it a little bit more volume at the top, but the holes are mainly at the bottom where we didn't double up. Okay, so up to the top. And I just have an idea for the top of the microphone. I am just going to go around like a donut. I might need more yarn. I should, have cut, I should have made a longer tail. Okay. I'm just kind of filling it in so it looks like the top of a microphone and not an ice cream cone. Yeah, I'm definitely going to need more yarn. That's okay. We'll add on some with a knot and work it through the middle. Should I start with black at the top? That's a good idea for next time. Start out with a, a dark color. Yeah. I don't know if I like the way that looks either. Ugh. Let's see if it's flattened out. Yeah. Okay. No. Look, it's too short. I don't know. I know this looks weird, but. We're going to thread this the opposite direction. Just trust me. Okay, so basically what you have is your original thread coming off this way from the yarn. Okay, on the top. And then on the bottom, the tail end of your other yarn. And we're just going to try and be very careful. And work that in. Because then I kind of weave it together. Just make sure you grab that end so it doesn't come out. Okay, now we can take those ends off of the needle right now. And take our crochet hook. Let's see how long these are. Those would go perfect right through the middle. Maybe we can cover some of those 
spots are actually getting better. What do I do right here? Take them all the way down. I'm going to try and get in front of the... There we go. I'm going to try and get in front of the... Uh, fuzz the stuffing. Okay, I'm gonna bring that hook. Now see I have that grip on the bottom. Now I'm kicking myself in the butt for that. Okay. Wherever this needle can come through. I want it to try and come through over here. Okay, attach these on. It's going to be hard because they're doubled up, but this will hide it very well. And just drag that right through the yarn. And pull the tails through. There we go. There's one right there. No, I should have put the little grippy thing on the bottom. Okay. There we go. I could have also used my little chibi needle and just did it backwards and drug it through. That probably would have left less mess. Okay. I zoom out because I know I'm probably going off camera. Okay, I just wanted you guys to be able to see what the heck I was doing, but I don't know if you did. So we're going to pull off a lot more black yarn. Sorry guys, I have been modifying this pattern as I go, and I think this is like my third or fourth time doing it. So I just keep modifying it a little bit each time. Grab my needle. Okay. And we're just going to try our best to make that top black. And round. So I'll just keep going over and over it. Ow. Just keep going over and over it until you can get a nice round black. And I might even go around the edges too, just to finish it up, make it look a little more finished. You know what trips me out? when I put my very first one on offer up because I just had way too many um, amokavermis. Um, <laughs> and a lot of them were still left over from Christmas. So yeah, I, I had a lot of them. I sold them on offer up for real super cheap, just like cost a yarn. And um, yeah, they went like hotcakes, man. The moment I upped my price by five bucks, like people just don't want to buy it. And it's like, I know, I mean, I know everyone's broke and everyone's looking for a deal, but dude, five bucks, it's just my time. And I don't even charge that much for my time because this is just something I love to do anyway. So I think five dollars is fair, but I still get people trying to get something for like like this for five bucks and I need to charge like you know 10 or 15 bucks depending on like the embellishments how much you know how much cost is in here and I know I could use a lot of yarn but I think my time is worth five dollars 
I don't know. Some thoughts on that would be nice. I always wonder about that. But then I go on Etsy and I see like people selling stuff for like a hundred and a hundred and fifty bucks and I'm like, dude, the yarn for that's like twenty dollars. How can you charge that much? You know, I don't think that that's fair, but then maybe they do this as, for a living, like as their career, and you kind of have to, they they do charge by their time, by the hour, I think. I mean, obviously supplies, but I'm sure that they also charge by the hour. Okay, this is starting to look kind of lumpy. Come on getting there. I'm going to have to go to that one over there. Oh, I'm trying to stay on camera, but it makes me lean forward. And it just sometimes kills the back. Okay, so we have to go back into this one, and let's go over to that one. Because I'm trying to make it smooth, but I don't know how smooth... Oh, uh, that wasn't a good idea. What did I do? I wanted to come across the top nice and smooth. I even messed that one up. Okay. Well, at this point, I'm going to turn on my... Dharma. I'll end this video so that, you know, I'm, I'm always consciously aware. I don't want to, like, offend people because I know not everybody's, like, people are like, oh my god, you know, that's not my religion. <sighs> that is really stuck in there on something. Oh, it's the stuffing. Here we go. Let's get the stuffing. Oh, my God. There we go. Just pull that out. Hit it with scissors or something. We'll get that later. I don't want to mess around with it while I'm doing it. Okay, so I'll stop this uh, video, and my next video will be me zenning out, just doing finishing touches. On, uh, and sewing on appendages. So if you want to zen out with me, you're more than welcome. If you already have an idea in mind and you know what you want to design this to look like, then you can skip that. And uh, then I will meet you here. Now, just a couple of little tidbits for those who are going to just skip and go ahead if you're new to this, then you can sit through the whole thing. Obviously, you're going to want to stuff this, but stuff it but on the looser side because if it's too tight, and I mean, this is filled, but it's, it gives away. You know what I mean? This pops back. So I fill this kind of loose up to like this point, and then... Then I stuffed it, and um, that tended to work best. You can look at the picture of Jigglypuff, and okay, this goes right in the middle, pretty much on top of her head, and goes forward and bends. So you'll know how to sew that on. If you don't know how to sew the pieces on, then for beginners or someone who just wants to see my technique, um, you can watch me sew on and stuff the... Um, the arms and the legs and all that fun stuff and if you know what you're doing just know that the two longer ones are the legs and the two shorter ones are your arms two shorter ones are your arms and then you have your two ears now I stuffed her ears they're as you can see they're pretty uh they're not overstuffed, but it's just so it's kind of retains that triangle shape, but with a little bit of depth to it. You don't want them to be like 
Ooh, really poofy. So just don't overstuff the ears. That's what I found. I like a little bit of roundness to them, a little bit of dimension, but they don't need to look like round balls. Okay, and then uh, the rest of this I'm just going to zen out and, and BS with you guys, and we will have a fantabulous um, Jigglypuff because I also will be going through my new design for the eyes that I want to do and all that fun stuff. So um, you can follow along at this point or just go on your own and make your own wonderful, fantabulous creation and just be happy with, uh, with this one. <laughs> okay, you guys have a great night and I will see you for my closing video. So there will be two more videos probably. Just the putting everything together and the embellishments, and that will be time consuming and boring. Um, thus, the Zen talk and maybe a little talk talk. And, um, and then my closing video showing you the comparison between uh, the different jiggly puffs one made with a four millimeter, one made with a three millimeter, and how the size differs and what the different looks could possibly be. You know, maybe Jigglypuff wants to be Batman for a day. Mmm, that's a thought. Everybody loves Batman. Da -na 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 -na. Anyway, okay, I will end this. And next video will be Zen Talk. If not, just skip the last video. Okay, so picking up where we left off with the <laughs> microphone. I'm just trying to... Well, that's pretty locked in there, so let's go to a different one. We'll cover that up. Oh my gosh, this polyfill is just everywhere. I should go grab my lint brush. Okay. So, if you want to just zen out and follow along with what I'm doing, I will try and make this as easy as possible. Um, probably need to put a lighter background on this so you can actually see what I'm, uh, I'm doing. Okay. And we will zoom up. Let's see, grab the phone. I was trying to post something to Facebook. Uh, okay, I mean, um, this exactly. I'm trying to pull in some videos from the Cirque du Soleil show tonight into Facebook because my I wanted to show my best friend. So that is what I am messing around with right now. Let's turn on the Zencast. To Mount Kailash, then she began really to want to do practice. And her, her friend was saying after a while, you know, I, it's too much. I'm too cold. There's not enough food. I really can't stay. And she said, of course, fine. Go on your way. But she really wanted to stay at Mount Kailash in practice. Now she's, what, 16, 17 at this point? So she starts doing full-length prostrations around Mount Kailash, you know, <laughs> going on and on, taking, you know, weeks and months and just storing a little sampa. And then, you know, doing prostrations, going back and getting the food. And so she's doing this, just living in caves for some time, really trying to purify her heart and mind and so she can say prayers for her dead relatives and all. And at this point, she said, she met um, a couple of lamas came, you know, realized beings. And they came and... Um, we're talking to her and saying, you know, what are you doing? And she was describing her practice and how she was trying to practice, you know, to 
be enlightened and also to say prayers for her parents. So the lamas, she said, I felt agonized by the thought that the Chinese had caused us suffering and killed without reason, yet I continued to practice. And so the lama was saying to them, well, how do you perceive the Chinese? And she said, well, to be honest, I perceive the Chinese as enemies, you know, and caused me so much harm, and I believe that they're enemies. And he said, well, you are doing a great deal of practice, but you know it's necessary to have love and compassion. And if you continue to perceive the Chinese as enemies, this does not conform with the Buddha Dharma. You really will never achieve complete enlightenment as long as that's how you are perceiving the Chinese. And so, you know, the Lamas tell you, if you practice this love and compassion, the Chinese, the enemy will not be the enemy, but like your relatives. If you can love the enemy without any degree of difference, if you can do that, if you can learn to feel no difference, this is what you need for practice. So she, of course, had great faith, you know, and she'd been brought up in great faith. So she really took it in and she, she, you know, really vowed to this Rinpoche, yes, I really will really practice. I want to do this. So she's staying now in around Mount Kailash for years and years, practicing, just living in caves. There's nowhere else to live. And she said, I put in tremendous effort to learn. I, did, I practice again and again really hard. I exercise again and again, even while eating. And finally, with the Lama's blessing and doing pilgrimage and prostrations around the mountain, meditating and putting in every effort I could, really focusing single-mindedly on this, this coming to you know, love and compassion, I couldn't do it for almost two years. So I'm thinking um, only two years she couldn't do it. It improved a bit, you know, that she could improved a bit. Then a little bit more. But the thought kept returning, you know, the thought of the Chinese as enemies. So I kept practicing while at Mount Kailash. You know, we think, you know, I think, I don't know what you think. I think, you know, okay, I've been doing metta for a couple of weeks, you know, and I still don't quite love myself. <laughs> okay. Um I am now going to go around just to make it look more finished. I think it would look better that way. So I'm just going to kind of do the under over thing, and, you know, under the stitch up the other side and pull it through and then backtrack. Kind of like, you know, when you're, when you're sewing, but you want to leave it a little loose. Don't make it tight. Make it loose so it's kind of fluffy and just pull it enough to where it covers everything because this next stitch is going to pull it a little tight. So then you go, you backtrack a stitch where you originally went in and instead of coming out in the same spot, you're going to come out in the next spot. So just keep following along there. Now this one you go right directly in front and then they'll come out the same spot, come out the next spot, and then just go around like that. Play. So, so she spent at least seven years there practicing practicing, practicing, you know, with this sincere devotion, but also the honesty of seeing. So how do you find the energy? How do you find the determination? How do you find the inspiration to keep going? So that's what inspires me. So she said, I lived at Mount Kailash for many years, practicing Dharma. There was no place to sleep except in caves. And so the interview is asking her, she's living been living in the, was living in the States for many years at the point of this interview. And the interviewer says, if one pract um, after spending seven years, can you help us understand what did you come to understand from that? And she says, if one practices diligently, it certainly is possible to realize enlightenment and help sentient beings. And those two are like 
conjoined, you know. So skipping, skipping, skipping. But this is what she said now, how she is now. You know that the essence of practice. I treat everyone with love. When people appreciate it, there is joy all around. That's the result of practicing the Dharma. However, you may not be able to practice love and compassion as the Dharma teaches all at once. I just kind of know a moment of peace, the possibility. So, she says, I do my Dharma practice. I continue to do my Dharma practice. That has brought me so much positive results. However, since I live in constant touch with human beings, these days I strive to bring happiness and peace to the people, try to elevate their suffering and multiply their joy and do whatever I can to help people. That is my work. So that's what I teach people in ordinary words, to love your parents and your family and then spread out to your community and spread out to the country. And then she's really working on developing love and peace between countries. To speak in terms of the Dharma teachings, you must really practice for years and years, which is difficult. I'm going to go around a second time. This is, you know, a real person. <laughs> I think I think she's passed away now, but this, I got the transmission from talking to my friend, and this kind of thing, was, oh, okay, this is possible. It's possible, and it can... It could, you know, if, you, if the mind isn't covered with kalatia at the moment, that sense of possibility, potential, if that's what speaks to you, can really bring an energy, a willingness, not the grasping to be like, but as she says, okay, years of practice. Can I just open into this moment as it is? That's really how the aspiration can support us, not in looking forward. But in really moment-to-moment -moment mindful awareness, what's happening now to meet it with fullness of attention, okay. the kindness. So, hey, that hey, comes I'm on my last little one in the awareness. second row around. And no expectation. So I'm just you know, each go moment is like a, an opening into the unknown. We have no out. idea what way each of our paths is going to take, you know? And even though I, I doubt most of us don't have the degree of physical suffering that she went through. We all have our okay, own particular this is the last difficulties one. This is good. and suffering that second and joys in our life. And it's and another kind of personality it. thing to say, well, my suffering top. isn't that much, so it's nothing, and push it away. You know, whatever suffering is occurring, that's the place where compassion and wisdom can land and grow. You know, so it's like opening into the unknown. We need the I need the aspiration to give you the faith and courage to keep doing that. I'm going to loop them around, and I don't think I want to pull too much where the bottom of my microphone is because I don't want to be scrunched up. So we'll go through the side where we're going to put the band. And this is where we're going to try and pull. So it flattens that out. I might need to do it again like over here. But I'm going to flatten it out. I don't want to pull my stitches too bad. Let's go. Let's cover some of this up. Let's go over one. Okay. And under that one. Over one, just so it kind of locks it in, because I don't want this to pucker up when I go up again, because that can happen. Okay, that's a good spot. Okay, and then we will just. 
creep up through the middle because you can't tell with back where the urine's going. Now we will come out on this this side. So it's kind of even on both sides. And that will, once I pull this, I give it more of a hoping like a uh, microphone shape. So we're just going to pull that, not too much. We don't want it lopsided. Okay. And I still like the black top, so okay, there we go. And then just leave it in. Do it a couple times. Don't be cheap and just do it the once unless it's going to sit on your shelf. Because if a kid's playing with this, something's going to come loose. And they are going to start chewing and picking at the yarn. And unless you know how to fix it, <laughs> that is a pain in the keister. I'm just basically weaving this in really, really good and kind of securing it and closing up some holes. Because okay. I can attach her hand to the back of it, so I don't care what that looks like right there. And we'll just take that tail out and we need to figure out something sparkly from right here. So I am going to pause you for a moment and I'll be back. Okay, so pretty much anything you missed, I grabbed my, my pens. I did stuff the, um, the appendages and those are ready to go. So I just kind of need to pair them up how they're going to go on the body. Okay, there's two legs, two ears, stick those down here, and two arms, and a microphone, and a toupee. Dude, she's a girl and she wears a toupee. Okay, so just uh follow along. Stick these over here. So we're going to go ahead and just cut this little piece off here, I think. So we'll just push down on our yarn a bit and then fluff it back out. And push down enough. Let's try it one more time. Okay, and that's where I get all my little yarn scraps. And stick it over there. Okay, so we're going to start with the top of the horn, for, or the top of the horn, the toupee. And one side of your work is going to be really smooth. That's the side you started on, and then one's going to have that little bump. That's the side we're going to want to stick it on, and pretty much we are going to sew it um, smack dead center. Exactly smack dead center. And let's see if I can zoom in so that you'll able to see my stitches. Now if you want to you can just throw a couple pins in there just so that uh, so that it holds it in place and keeps it in the shape you want it. Okay so nothing runs away on you while you're going and you'll just take those out as you as you uh, go along. Now I'm going to talk a little bit. I don't plan on talking a lot. Because I just want to show you kind of how I've been doing my sewing lately. And it seems to leave no major creases, so that's a good thing. Okay, so this is our slip stitch right here. So if we start, 
uh, try and get the angle right. We're starting right here next to our slip stitch, and you can start in the same one, it really doesn't matter. But just go down, under, and up through, uh, I think it's like two stitches, so you're kind of skipping a hole. And pull that yarn through, but not tight, just taut. Okay, now come up through. You're going to leave one of these empty. Okay, and you're going to bring your needle up through the next one. And just kind of secure it down. Push it down with your hand a little. You don't want to pull on the yarn too much. And you are going to go down through the one before it. And it doesn't matter if it's one or two, at least not in my opinion. And then you'll go to the very next, next stitch. And you have the one in between, so you always have like one in between. Okay, because it kind of just goes in there and you can't tell you did a stitch. And then go to the one behind it that you skipped. Try and make sure you're on front of the stocking. Okay. Get through those two. I don't like to do just the front loop because it it seems like it pulls. And then go down through one. And we will see our yarn's coming through this one. So we want to come up right up underneath that one. And if we're really good. We can even go through those two and just do it in one fell swoop of a stitch. And then we'll go back through the one behind it. And this is where you're probably going to need to start removing some of your pins. Okay, so we went back through the one behind it and down into the work and then come up and this next stitch. And I actually went through the bottom and up through the top. So we did the whole, it went here, it came up two over, and then up through the next stitch. I just find it easier just to kind of grab everything in one false swoop. Okay, and then we'll go down to the one behind it. And just follow that all the way around. I am going to turn on my Dharma Talk now, so if you don't want to listen to any more of this, um, then just turn it off. Because I know I can go on. But I'm doing this for people that like have never done this before, or might need help, or want to watch the full tutorial. But if you're going to watch the full tutorial with me, I've got to sit here and do it and help, help out, which I, I love doing, then I will play my Dharma Talks. Okay. Oh, yay, my card captor Sakura bag got shipped. Woohoo. Okay. Who's a long term meditator, practitioner. And she has been involved for many years in what's called the Tibet Oral History Project, which is run, which is um, involved in interviewing elderly Tibetan refugees, just getting interviews, whole stories of their lives. Some of them are up on the web, and and she had we talked. She told me about this some years previously, and had shared a particular story, which she'd actually sent me the the whole interview. But anyway, when we were talking the other day. And she just kind of burst out again saying, and talking about practice and just talking. Was like she remembered this woman that she interviewed, Jang Chet Palmo. And uh, really, the depth of her wisdom and the simplicity of her kindness and love and, and caring for everyone around her and the incredible suffering she'd been through and practice in her life was so inspiring to my friend. Remember, my friend had met this person in person just uh, a few years ago. So this is a real-life person, which sometimes is so much more juicy, 
you know, you think, well, the Buddha, okay, but 2,600 years ago, maybe, you know, things have changed, like Buddha Dasa was saying. But as to the profoundness of the depth of her wisdom and what she'd gone through, and here she is sitting in this really loving, simple person, caring for everyone. She said, that really inspired me. Why settle for less? Why settle for less? You know, it's really possible. So I'm going to just want, so because that inspired me, so she inspired me, my friend, who was inspired by this woman. So I'm going to give you a little brief synopsis, tell a story, the story. I mean, it's long, so I'm not going to, just I'm really cutting it down. But So Jang Chep Palmo, um, when she, she was born in Tibet in 43, to a nomadic family, but also fairly well-to-do at that time. And when she was about 15, and after the Chinese had been in um, the country for a few years, but then when they started to really destroy the monasteries and such, she and her family and village were all trying to flee to India, as so many did. And they got involved in a firefight, with some of the Chinese army, and so many, most of the relatives she was with, her parents or siblings that she was with, were killed. And she was shot, she had like several bullet wounds in her legs and arms. She was 15 at this time. And so she was captured and taken, and really it wasn't to a jail camp, but to sort of a, sort of like a house arrest, you know. And they took care of her and, and took care of her wounds and all. But she was so determined she wanted to escape so that she could practice the Dharma. She'd come from, her family had been really quite religious, quite involved with the uh, Buddhist practice and knowing many um, mamas. And, and she herself was quite spiritual from a young age. So she very much uh, couldn't practice and she wanted to say prayers for her dead relatives and just basically practice the Dharma. So a couple of different attempts, but anyway, finally when she was 16, she's 16 years old, and she'd more or less healed her leg wounds, she managed to escape with one other person. This is in Tibet, like in the winter. And they managed to escape and flee, and I mean, it's a whole long story, I'm cutting this short, through the winter, falling in icy in icy ponds, not having any food, going over passes, running into also other, like one woman who took them to her house and completely gave them food for the journey and ways to carry it, so people who would support them. And they finally managed, they managed to escape, she and this other woman. And they traveled for one year, one year, they got to Mount Kailash. One year walking around Tibet with nothing, escaping from the Chinese. So they got to Mount Kailash. And when they got to Mount Kailash, then she began really to want to do practice. And her, her friend was saying after a while, you know, I, it's too much. I'm too cold. There's not enough food. I really can't stay. And she said, of course, fine, go on your way. But she really wanted to stay at Mount Kyle. Okay, now we have kind of reached the end here. And so I have all these little, I mean, they're noticeable, but it's not, um, it kind of blends with the work. And I know if I did the front stitch, that would be beautiful, but for some reason, I must pull too tight because then you just see these pulled stitches kind of going down. So this is my my method. <laughs> okay, so we have to figure out where the front of Ghibli's face is going to be and figure out how this bends the best because that's going to determine whatever way it naturally wants to bend because the face is all going to be the same all the way around. I am just going to take this and thread it down into the hole. And it's still kind of sticking out. That's the point. Okay, and I am going to... How am I going to show you this? Because I'm doing this upside down right now. Okay, so we'll do Jiggly Puffs Puff. I've seen it both ways. I've seen it this way with green eyes, and I've seen it this way with blue eyes. I don't know if that's uh, like the difference between a Japanese anime character or an American, 
or if it's just different pictures, but I have seen different pictures and I'm trying not to go into Google and let that influence what I'm doing. So I, I went down into this hole just so that when that goes, it's going to kind of hide it. I'm trying to hide it under there because I don't want a, a, you know, yarn pulling. So we need to maybe push some of this stuffing down to the tip. Remember I said fill the tip nice, but leave this kind of mushy. And this is why. Okay, so we're going to try and bring that needle through underneath that because you want it to be kind of hidden. Pull your yarn through, but not too tight. You don't want to buckle in the back. <clears throat> and what I found is just going in through the two paste somewhere here. It is really hard to bend, maybe less stuffing next time. Okay, and then try and figure out where I want the bottom to attach, which is here. So I'm just going through a couple stitches. Okay, and I don't want it to pull on the back. So when I go to fasten it to the head, I am going to pull it through two stitches on the head. And I don't know if you can see that because this will cover it up. Where it, that's where it's going to kind of go right there. So pull it through two stitches on the body and just hold it down with your finger so you're not pulling the back here. That's kind of the goal and I should have anchored it a little better before but keep that in mind for next time. Okay and then you will anchor this down because you don't want it pulling. So I'm going to just go in a stitch above and then like one or two stitches over and then back around through those so it anchors it. I'm trying to come out underneath here so that when I do start fastening it lays flat. I better start fastening soon. I'm running out of yarn. Okay, so then this one, you just got to kind of stand it up and, okay, this is where I want my stitches. We can always go back and make that a little tighter. We just don't want to buckle the back, but at least it's down, so it makes this part easier because this is hard to do in here. So I usually turn it upside down, and I find a spot that's underneath, about two stitches wide. It just gives it uh, more uh, security. And then we are just going to fasten this down really good so that any little kids that might want to pop in their mouth don't get the thing off. And this is part of the reason why on my craft page, I um, my just for fun page, my Bobsha crafts, I uh, I, I, I list, I, these are crafts. These are not baby toys. So just be careful when you see a lot of little pieces and parts and stuff that just make sure that you give it to somebody who's age appropriate. And start kind of pulling it taut and it won't affect the back of it. Play with your stuffing, kind of form it how you want it to be. And you know I was thinking earlier about pipe cleaner in here might work. So we're just going to give this a shot. Let's measure this out because this is where I want this curve. Right here. It's probably going to be too hard to um, too hard to do throughout the whole thing, but that's bent pretty good. I'm happy with that. I just want this to bend over more. So I'm going to take our pipe cleaner 
and this is just my idea. I mean, it's her video. You just, I guess you just sew it. I don't think she shows how to like sew everything on. You just kind of got to look at it and guess. But her work is awesome. Okay. So now I think we can bring that over again. I'm trying to make it so no sharp pieces are sticking out. And then just give it some thickness because you, you don't want it to break. So it's got to be thick in there. Okay. Bring that tip in. Okay, let's try inserting this into the hole. It looks like it might just barely fit. I'm going to try and angle it towards the... This is hard with the stuff, and I should have did this before, but I just thought about it now. I remembered it again now. Okay, so let's get that on top and we can like bend the end in so that there's nothing sharp. I'm just going to make it through the hole. Okay. I'm trying to weave it around it. Definitely got to put this in early the next time. But this is how creations are born. There are no mistakes, just happy coincidences. That's what Bob Ross says, anyway. Okay, there we go. Got it. And I can always add a little stitch in there to close that up a little better. But let's see how this works. Oh, nice. Okay. I'm trying to feel where it is. It's hard to feel. Ah, okay, we got a nice curve going. Let's try and wrap that around my finger. Because I really like a nice curly Q kind of curve. Okay. And flatten it out so it looks more of a jigglypuff. There we go. Oh, that's looking nice. And it's not poking through. Beautiful. Okay, now we're coming out the bottom, so let's go through the top, and just make sure we anchor this real good, so it doesn't come out. It's hard to work underneath something, but I mean... Still gotta get that in the tip. Okay, and this is where we wanna go through the bottom. I'm gonna come up over here. I think we just might have just enough here left. Okay, look at that. To here, up. Just trying to anchor it from the bottom. Okay. Put it down. Smush it. Don't be afraid. Okay, that's looking good. I'm not seeing stitches like, you know, the, the, the lines. This one, this, yeah, this one has a little... This is why I would probably only charge like 10 bucks for this one because see the little lines you can actually see where I anchored it down. But I'm getting better the more of these I do. Okay. Just trying to pull it nice and taut so that you really don't see any strings, but I don't want too much gapping. I don't want to scrunch up. Okay, I'm going to go towards the middle, angle towards the middle, and up. 
that original one and then all we have to really do is the tip so let's see here where do I want it I think that looks good I really think that looks good it's angled nice so let's just anchor that down kind of facing upwards I'm going to up right because you want to get up underneath those stitches and then come up through the middle and then we'll just seal this hole shut. Good. I don't want to do it like you know. Just Pinch it shut. I should have. I'm going to go back and go to this one. Okay, that's better. I'm cold like a magic ring. Just pull it and then do a, a stitch that's going to. Oh, have you had a yarn? It's okay, we're almost done. Okay, just there we go. Pull it taut. And let's go through one of the sides. Okay. And I think at this point I'm just gonna use the crochet hook. Okay, maybe not. I was going to try, but it's way too much stuffing to go through and it won't slide through and I'll be pulling stuffing out. So I'll go in through the middle here, back down to that stitch that we just made, where the stitch goes in. Bring it over one or two, whatever, uh, whatever it will allow you to do. Top. And then since I really don't have much in the way of what's left, it is. I'm just going to go backwards with the needle. Just to kind of anchor it in the, some of these little holes here so it won't come loose. Like I said, you really you can't tell. I mean, you're going to be adding eyes and all kinds of stuff. So, okay. And then just weave that through like that. And hopefully, hopefully, the yarn will blow up loose. And all you have is this. And you can just smush it down and cut it. And there we go. It's weaved through the work. And I think it looks pretty good. And just play with it and shape it how you want it. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn on the Dharma Talk. Pretty much how I sewed that one on is how I am going to do uh, the arms, the legs, and I'm just going to pin some things in place. Okay, so here we go. Let's see what we're and we're right. in practice. Now she's what 16, 17 at this point. So she starts doing full length prostrations around Mount Kailash, you know, <laughs> going on and on taking, you know, weeks and months and just storing a little sampa and then, you know, doing prostrations, going back and getting the food. And so she's doing this, just living in caves for some time, really trying to purify her heart and mind, and so she can say prayers for her dead relatives and all. And at this point, she said, she met um, a couple of lamas came, you know, realized beings. And they came and um, 
were talking to her and saying, you know, what are you doing? And she was describing her practice and how she was trying to practice, you know, to be enlightened and also to say prayers for her parents. So the lamas, she said, I felt agonized by the thought that the Chinese had caused us suffering and killed without reason, yet I continued to practice. And so the lama was saying to them, well, how do you perceive the Chinese? And she said, well, to be honest, I perceive the Chinese as enemies, you know. They've caused me so much harm, and I believe that they're enemies. And he said, well, you are doing a great deal of practice, but you know it's necessary to have love and compassion. And if you continue to perceive the Chinese as enemies, this does not conform with the Buddha Dharma. You really will never achieve complete enlightenment as long as that's how you are perceiving the Chinese. And so, he's, he's, you know, the Lama's telling if you practice this love and compassion, the Chinese, the enemy will not be the enemy, but like your relatives. If you can love the enemy without any degree of difference, if you can do that, if you can learn to feel no difference, this is what you need for practice. So she, of course, had great faith, you know, and she'd been brought up in great faith. So she really took it in and she, she, you know, really vowed to this Rinpoche, yes, I really will really practice. I want to do this. So she's staying now in around Mount Kailash for years and years, practicing, just living in caves. There's nowhere else to live. And she said, I put in tremendous effort to learn. I, I practice again and again really hard. I exercise again and again, even while eating. And finally, with the Lama's blessing... Okay, we're going to go ahead and, and start sewing those that I'm not happy with where the mountain, they are. And meditating then we will do the arms. every effort I could, really focusing single-mindedly on this, this coming to you know, love and compassion. I couldn't do it for almost two years. I'm thinking oh, only two years she couldn't do it it improved a bit you know that she could improved a bit then a little bit more but the thought kept returning you know the thought of the Chinese as enemies so I kept practicing while at Mount Kailash you know we think you know I think I don't know what you think I think you know okay I've been doing meta for a couple of weeks you know and I still don't quite love myself you know? <laughs> so so she spent at least seven years there practicing, 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 you know, with this sincere devotion, but also the honesty of things. So how do you find the energy? How do you find the determination? How do you find the inspiration to keep going? So that's what inspires me. So she said, I lived at Mount Kailash for many years, practicing Dharma. There was no place to sleep except in caves. And so the interview is asking her, she's living, been living in the, was living in the States for many years at the point of this interview. And the interviewer says, if one practice, um, after spending seven years, can you help us understand what did you come to understand from that? And she says, if one practices diligently, it certainly is possible to realize enlightenment and help sentient beings. And those two are like conjoined, you know. So, skipping, skipping, skipping. But this is what she's saying now, how she is now. You know, that the essence of practice. I treat everyone with love. When people appreciate it, there is joy all around. That's the result of practicing the Dharma. However, you may not be able to practice love and compassion as the Dharma teaches all at once. I just kind of know a moment of peace, the possibility. So, she says, I do my Dharma practice. I continue to do my Dharma practice. That has brought me so much positive results. However, since I live in constant touch with human beings, these days I strive to bring happiness and peace to the people, try to elevate their suffering and multiply their joy and do whatever I can to help people. That is my work. So 
That's what I teach people in ordinary words, to love your parents and your family and then spread out to your community and spread out to the country. And then she's really working on developing love and peace between countries. To speak in terms of the Dharma teachings, you must really practice for years and years, which is difficult. This is, you know, a real person. <laughs> I think I think she's passed away now, but this, I got the transmission from talking to my friend, and this kind of thing, like, oh, okay, this is possible. It's possible, and it can... It could, you know, if, if the mind isn't covered with kalatia at the moment, that sense of possibility, potential, if that's what speaks to you, can really bring an energy or willingness, not to the grasping to be like, but as she says, okay, years of practice. Can I just open into this moment as it is? That's really how the aspiration can support us, not in looking forward but in really moment-to-moment -moment mindful awareness, what's happening now, to meet it with fullness of attention, the kindness that comes with a compassionate awareness, and no expectation. You know, each moment is like a, an opening into the unknown. We have no idea what way each of our paths is going to take, you know? And even though... I, I doubt most of us don't have the degree of physical suffering that she went through. We all have our own particular difficulties and sufferings and joys in our life. And it's another kind of personality thing to say, well, my suffering isn't that much, so it's nothing, and push it away. You know, whatever suffering is occurring, that's the place where compassion and wisdom can land and grow, you know. So... It's like opening into the unknown. We need the, I need the aspiration to give me the faith and the courage to keep doing that moment after moment after moment. And as I said in the beginning of the talk, certainly for me, I think for most people on retreat, and I'm mostly talking about on retreat here just because that's where we are, we keep on coming to places where it's difficult, no? I call it Sometimes it feels like hitting the wall. You know, you've been going, 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 and suddenly it's like, oh, no. We hit the wall in so many different kinds of ways, and some walls are harder than others. Sometimes the wall is just a little bit of foam, you know, and you just kind of bounce and can keep on going. Sometimes the wall is really solid brick, and you run into it really at full speed, and it's like whack, you know. <laughs> I can't keep going. I'm out of here. And it almost doesn't matter what the particular content is, although there's different contents, but it's just that sense of being thrown back. How do I find the trust and the energy to just open again, land again in this moment? As Ajahn Sumedho gives this, uh, I think people have mentioned it, but he's talking about being in Thailand when he was practicing as a monk and in the hot season and it's really hot and these little kotis, these little huts with a tin roof, Never been in a tin roof when it's like 110 degrees out, and you cook. Um, this is from personal experience. You cook. And he says, he's sitting in there just sweating through his robes, just sweating through his robes. I cannot bear this one more moment. Have you ever had that feeling? <laughs> About whatever. He said, and then I would find that I could. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I use that so often. Oh, this is just unbearable. And then my mind would go, Yeah, what's actually unbearable? And that's not like a that's not like a snide comment, it's like a real quick what's actually unbearable about this? And usually I find it's just that was a moment of aversion, just saying, I don't feel like being here anymore, basically. I then I found that I could. So different ways, I just want to mention a couple of ways we hit the wall. There's many more. Just maybe so you know you're not alone, although maybe nobody here will have experienced any of those, in which case I'm just revealing myself. <laughs> but I, I, I tend to doubt that. <laughs> so one way is just simply how impermanence manifests in relation to either the technique of our practice, what's arising in the sitting and the walking, 
how impermanence manifests, and we don't see it as impermanence as causes and conditioning changes, but we take it personally. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. When things are smooth, the breath, you're with the breath, and it's quiet and subtle, it's pretty effortless, okay. there's not much clean. Yeah, this is now how it is. This is now really we're how just it gonna is. Kind of and you go out to walk, and you come to another sitting, and, and the mind's somewhere. just all over the place, and there's nothing but thinking, and you think, what did I do wrong, right? Isn't that like, what did I do wrong? There's a, a sutta from the time of the Buddha I like a lot in this, with a, a monk called Asaji, who was, had been, he was really ill, and probably on the verge of dying, but he had been practicing a long time, and had strong practice, and so... He was talking, the Buddha came and was talking to him, and Asaji was sick, afflicted, gravely ill. But he was very troubled. He said to the Buddha, I'm very troubled by regret, by remorse. And the Buddha says, why? Have you done unskillful things? Have you done unwholesome things? Have you had bad virtue? And he said, no, not at all. So the Buddha said, so what's bothering you, basically? And Asaji says, well, formerly venerable, when I was ill, I could keep on tranquilizing the bodily formations. I could calm the body with concentration, with samadhi. But now I cannot achieve concentration. I cannot calm the bodily formations with concentration. Now I think, oh no, let me not fall away. Oh no, I can't get concentrated anymore. I'm losing it. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Okay. And the Buddhist basically said, Asaji, haven't I said over and over <laughs> that the conditions coming together give rise to the results, and when the conditions change, the result will change. Formally, you can take concentration. He's basically saying, okay, this is my synopsis. Asaji, you're gravely ill. You're dying. The conditions for concentration arising do not exist. But in my teaching, concentration is not the essence. The essence is insight, the path and the fruit. So I said, don't glom on to that and get all upset because the conditions have changed. But I like it because it's like, that's just what we do, you know? Oh, no, it's gone. It was all about this. So that's one way. So just noticing that when things change, instead of taking it personally, notice how the conditions have changed. Oh, it's like this now. We need some inspiration, some trust, some faith sometimes to do that, not to get sucked into our personal story of, I blew it. I'm not good enough. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> Other ways is um, not just when it changes, but when we're really seeing things, but it seems like so much, we just kind of feel, oh, I can't see this anymore. Like oftentimes about now people are saying, I'm seeing, I'm just seeing so much clinging. It feels like every single moment what I see is clinging. Or another person will say that about aversion. Or someone will say about, about conceit with body toy, or just the sense of self. It's here all the time, every single moment, you know, and it's like, and we'll go, oh, yeah, great, that's great, we're seeing it, you know? <laughs> but it's unbearable, right? <laughs> I can't bear to keep seeing this anymore. Doesn't it feel like that? It just kind of wears us down, you know, and uh, even though we'll say, well, it's, I always say it's true, but it's not complete, you know, it's like, it's like we haven't quite seen it so clearly. So when we start to see it clearly, it just stands out. It's like that's all we see. Sense of self arising about every single little thing. Oh, my God. Never saw it before. So we, it really stands out. So it's true, but it isn't complete. It's a little bit magnified or a lot magnified because of the constant, something Uteja Nia said I love. Concentration magnifies experience. The collations exaggerate. Yeah? Put those two together, that's when we go wild with yogi mind, right? 
and something that just is a little thing is like huge. So see, so something that's really an insight, seeing sense of self arising or how much clingings or how every little thing can seem like clinging, that's really useful insight, seeing how subtle and how frequently it arises. It's magnified through the stillness of some concentration. Even those of you who think you have no concentration, that's because you have some idea what it should look like. But there's some stillness, some steadiness in the mind. Or you couldn't even sit here for 45 minutes without going nuts. Um, so, so seeing it with <laughs> the concentration... <laughs> But if there's a little bit of aversion or a little bit of something, that's the collation that magnifies it. And that's when it's like, oh my God, hit the wall. I can't look at this one more time. For me, that's when I can call up the aspiration. Okay, I don't know where it's going, but there's the trust to just drop in. Okay, I can't bear it. And then I found that I could. Just this moment. Not the whole future. Not the whole past. Just this moment. Or when we see our bad habits, our unpleasant habits of mind, and the patterns that have been difficult, and we're seeing them really clear, but with insights. Oh, I always get reactive in this situation, and I see how that's driven, and we, and we really understand it. And we have this sense, oh, maybe it's not going to happen so much anymore to really have that hope. First, it's a belief. Then it's a hope. And then we see it not only happening, with awareness it's happening, so it's more painful. And then we act on it again, still, with awareness. And we think, and, do you know what I mean? You can watch yourself doing the unskillful thing, which is actually better than doing it without awareness. Even the Buddha said that. But it's more painful. That's why it's better. Because, no, <laughs> I know. That sounds sadistic. It's not. <laughs> really. <laughs> wisdom it's wisdom that abandons the unskillful patterns because it's wisdom not it's not an act of personal will but when in acting in unskillful ways and the awareness is coming along we go oh wow eating that 17th orange like i mentioned the other time that actually isn't really bringing happiness you know and I'm like, maybe i don't need to do that and that puts it down wisdom puts it down but the wisdom has to kind of come along to see how the suffering's being created through the wanting and the aversion. But when we don't see that, that's again like hitting a wall. Not only are my patterns still here, they're worse. I'm more neurotic than when I started. And it's like, I, I can't, you know, what's the point? That's another place. And just one other I want to mention. Sometimes when we're really opening into new insights, Perceptions maybe we haven't had before, or in the same depth, maybe really a, an intimation of what non-clinging, the heart-mind of non-clinging really could be like in a moment. Or an intimation of really the sense of self, the sense of thing just kind of not arising. Now sometimes fear will come when there's that little sense, oh, it could be possible. And that's okay. Fear just comes. That's nothing personal. It's just a habit. That's not what I'm calling hitting the wall. But sometimes for people, at different times, you can get a sense of intimation. Oh, this, if non-clinging is really, the liberation of heart mind through non-clinging is really um, radical. It's uncompromising. It's not, I let non-clinging to anything except this one particular thing still get to hang around. It's not like we can get to abandon all the unpleasant experiences but still feel personally gratified by the pleasant ones. I remember one retreat I was suddenly realizing I wasn't really, awareness really wasn't picking up the unpleasant, aversion wasn't coming, but the pleasant ones would come in and it was kind of like, oh, let's land in that one. That's still, you know, I was like, huh. You don't get to have it both ways, you know. And so sometimes there can be, at least for me, I've noticed an intimation. Oh, so liberation means even that. You know, I don't even get to hold on personally even to that, whatever it might be. And there can just be this little sense, I don't know if I want to go there. 
you know? And it's, it's, that's because it's some idea we have. We don't really know, but it's like, oh. So I've noticed for myself, it's like a sense of wanting to go back to the pleasure garden. You know, when the Buddha had, had was brought up in all these pleasure gardens and everything, and he left and went on his quest. But sometimes we're out there and we think, oh, I just would like to go back, just for a little bit, to the pleasure garden. It's not like we're abandoning all pleasant experience, but the pleasure garden is that sense of feeling fulfilled by it. Was talking to someone today, and, you know, talk, and I feel that myself, I just was kind of... Sometimes I wish I could just go back to thinking, oh, if I could just go have that movie, see that movie's really going to do it for me, you know. And you can still go see the movie, but we know it doesn't really do it for us, you know. So this kind of, um, Chogim Trungpa called it a, a nostalgia for samsara. Yeah? That's a great line, isn't it? And I felt in, sometimes in my practice, different times where there's a particular personality pattern or some way I've perceived myself that I wasn't even aware of and it just becomes clear you know it just comes up and it's so obvious something about it's just dissipating going away and there's a sense of a of a small death of some idea of myself that isn't even particularly pleasant but like it's comfortable it's where we're at ease it's a sense of almost of a, a grief or a mourning of the passing of some sense of myself, which is just an idea because that sense of yourself doesn't really go very far, but you start to see through it. And so sometimes that's like, ah, oh, okay, this is far enough. No more. But, you know, we never just stay in one place. You can notice when that's funny kind of hitting the wall. Okay, I think I'll stop for a while. I'm, I'm, I don't want to give that up. But that's just a momentary thought, an idea. So as Buddha Dasa says, you know, Nibbana is for everyone. And it's demanding for all of us. It's challenging for all of us. We're all going to face, to meet many, many, many really difficult, confusing moments on our path of awakening. And these are, in some ways, the most maybe not the most, but really important, really important and valuable moments. Oh, on our buddy. Because this is where we're really kind that of up against the belief you, systems huh? we maybe don't know we have, or the, the areas we've gotten comfortable in, but that are really kind of keeping us, you know, in our little cage of Sakaya Ditti, our little cage of what we believe hey, is man. possible for this personality, maybe without even realizing it. And it's not like we have to break the cage. We just have to see, oh, that's an idea. Bring in whatever inspires you. Okay, that's an idea of what's actually just happening now. An idea can hang around there, but just drop into what's happening now. It's impossible not to come up against this. And our path is lifelong and all-inclusive. It includes not just being on our dream, everything in our life, all aspects of our life. Freedom from clinging is uncompromising. Really, there's no part left out. And I believe with our most sincere intentions and aspirations and everything we read and talk about and hear from other people, our minds, our thinking minds, can't really imagine what that would be like. We can only imagine kind of a takeoff of what we already know, you know. We want to, I mean, I know in my mind, I want to know something ahead of time, you know, peaceful, nice, we use all these nice words, but we don't really know. We don't really know, you know. We want to know what to aim for, you know. We want a sense of uh, um, what awakening is going to be like, something I can compare it to now that keeps me going. But, you know, it's the only thing I can say about what I can grok in words is, Really, freedom of heart, mind, freedom of mind from non-clinging, real awakening. It, it's not going to be some state that confirms us and makes us feel all comfortable and secure. You know, it's not going to make us feel good because it's the sense of us that gets seen through. But from the sense of me trying to understand, that's all we can. The only way we can think about it. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
So along the way, at different times, we're really inspired, really energized, beautiful things happen, really amazing insights. Uh, our heart develops, are open, we feel love, we feel compassion, we see the change. And then at other times, we're really challenged. All of our views and assumptions and the ones we don't even know we have are going to get challenged. It can get to where it's kind of, I love it, usually. <laughs> when all of a sudden I think I'm really ill and easy, I go, oh, that's how I thought things were. That's the view in the background that is running the show right now. Oh, great. Great to see that. It's not how it is. So to me, this is really why we need to keep finding, in each of our own ways, the energy, the commitment, the determination, the aspiration to just keep putting one foot in front of the other, one moment one moment, opening to what is without needing to know what it's going to be like, where it's going to go, how our life is going to unfold. All right, I have to skip all of that part. <laughs> so I'll just come to say that I was going to talk about determination, but that's for another time. So I say just what I, to offer in terms of aspiration, to find for yourself not only what aspiration comes up for you, but explore, and probably you already know for yourself, what helps you to, when in the times of difficulty, or it's just dry, or when you've lost touch with that inspiration, with what keeps you going, finding um, ways to reconnect with that. So, um, for me, like one of the reasons I read the story, excuse me, about the Tibetan woman, is because it does really get me back in touch with inspiration, with aspiration. And for me, that's one of the ways that really helps me, calling to heart, to mind. Various people, beings that I know, they don't have to be like completely awakened, but they may manifest different aspects of beautiful qualities that brighten the heart and mind, you know. And, and the way it's working is that, that that aspect of that person wakes up that aspect in our own heart and mind. So finding, that's one way, different people. Like I'm thinking, I thought of today, this, this monk I, we know in, uh, in Burma, known for about 15 years, and he's this very simple, peaceful guy, Ujayanta, very meta-filled. And he's just, he's looked the same for 15 years. I don't know, he doesn't look a day older, right? He's just, and he would go to visit him every year when we go there. And he's just simple and friendly. You just, you just feel metta and peace in his very simple monastery up in the Sagain Hills. I have a picture of him. And just, he doesn't say much. It's not like you get this deep wisdom, but you get metta and peace. And look, it's just who he is. So I'm, I get chills when I think about it, you know. And that's because if I couldn't access that in my own heart-mind stream, it wouldn't ins inspire me, right? So when we think, when you think of other people that bring whatever aspect it is alive in you, realize that it's coming alive in you. I know lots of different nuns in, in Burma, because I, I go there every year, and, and the nuns in Burma, it's, uh, there's many, many women in Burma who are nuns, and it's not that they're all really super awakened. It's one of the, uh, especially in the past, it's changing a little now. One of the not so many avenues for women who weren't married or had kids to to so live I ended um, up with the back a of safe here. and healthy life, really. And many of the poor nuns, they also take in poor, either orphan little girls or girls that their parents have asked the nuns or the monk in, in their home villages have asked the nuns to take them because they're very poor or they only have one parent, or they can't really get an education where they live, and the nuns can help them get to school. So a lot of the nunneries function as a kind of a safety net for, for poor young girls. So, But, th but these nuns, so I can think of a lot of them. I'll just I'll tell you one. A lot of them, they, they don't all do deep what we think of an intensive meditation practice, although some of them have that deep aspiration. But they... So what many of the nuns do as their practice is, is um, Buddha Nupasana, which is recollecting the qualities of a Buddha. 
and they do this with chanting and they do it with contemplation every day, every day. And you can feel it brings them really deep faith, a deep kind of inspiration that kind of shines out of them and gives them the energy to do in what is often really quite a hard life, quite a demanding life. And so, um, well, one nun, you know, she became a nun when she was sick in her 20s and almost dying. And her parents were about to give their last money, sell their last things to, to support her, to get doctors. And she said, forget it. I'm going to become a nun instead so you don't have to give up your whole farm. And she became a nun, and she had so much faith that it healed her. This was about not quite 20 years ago. And it healed her. And then her sister also became a nun. They came to Rangoon and were really excited to become deep meditation nuns. They went to a meditation center, and this is really what they wanted to do. And then there was a big cyclone in their home village down in the Delta, and the Sayadaw, the head monk of the village, sent them maybe 10 or 15 young girls to take care of. This is very common. So they had to just do a 180-degree turn. This is Do'utara, that's her name, 180-degree turn, and leave the meditation monastery, go find some little piece of land that they had to raise money to buy, build a little shaky bamboo hut, and start taking care of these little girls, these 10 or 15 little girls who become nuns, and they have to then, they all live on donations, you know, alms food and uh, the money for their clothes. and So they're completely dedicated to taking care of these little girls. So this is a 20-year project, right? It's just turned around completely, with totally doing it, with complete love and tenderness, and visited them every year for like the last nine years or so, and you can see the little girls growing, and new ones come, of course, it never really ends. But the, the tenderness, the care, the love, the friendliness, it's not like, oh, we've got to do this and then we're going to go meditate. It's like this is now their practice. And the faith and the love just shines out. And they still say when they're grown, if the girls don't want to stay nuns, great, but we've given them a grounding in morality and how to live a good life. They help them go to school, and the schools, by the way, are run by other nuns who have devoted their whole life to starting these schools because a lot of poor kids can't afford the government school fees. And so they're helping these kids do this with all the love in their heart, and this is their dharma practice, you know. They still sing, and then when they're gone, we'll go back and we'll do our meditation. So that's just, so I think of Dha Utara. So in that way, she really inspires me too with this sense of deep faith and that you turn around and what life presents you becomes the practice of compassion and awakening. So that's one way. Finding your own life. Maybe you picture someone you know. I was just talking to James. He says he gets all teary about Audrey Hepburn. She really inspires him. You know, it's like, it could be anybody who has particular qualities <laughs> of goodness, you know, that can come out for you. This is just what happens. Okay, so our Dharma talk has ended, and we are almost done. I'm just uh, doing the leg right now. And we're about halfway there. So, let's see. Getting there, getting there. I'm so excited. I always love just decorating them. Decorating them is so fun. You know, I think it would be kind of a cool concept for my birthday if I made some of these and got other crafters to make something and we all pull together and like buy a cow or a chicken or something for uh, the heifer program. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. It's, it's really cool. It helps people in other countries to actually, you know, earn an income on their own. If you buy them a chicken, then they can 
uh, use the eggs for food or sell the eggs if um, you, if you buy them a oops if you buy them a cow then they they get milk and each thing costs uh, each thing costs something different I can't get that out of there without ripping the yarn so I'm just going to do a little just a little snip Oh good, it didn't mess it up, okay. Um, but I think instead of asking people for help, I mean, it'd be awesome if people like just said, yeah, you know, Bapsha, and just so you know, Bapsha is uh, Polish for grandma. I started this uh, channel when my granddaughter was born about, oh, shortly after she was born, not like when she was born. And, um, and I started doing the American Girl stuff because I wanted to give her the American Girl doll experience. But anyway, I think what I'll do is I'll just like for the month of July, which is my birthday, I am going to make a bunch of these and try to sell them at work or at work or on offer up and then whatever the profits are that I make and I'll, I mean I'm going to try and keep my costs under you know in, under control but whatever the uh, whatever the profit is for that one month of July then I will take whatever money I make and um, buy somebody a cow or an thus the heifer and the heifer program or a chicken or whatever I can afford with whatever I make from uh, doing crafts. I think that would be a good idea. Okay, so I'm just going to finish sewing on this leg. I will try, hopefully have enough yarn to do this arm. If not, I can use part of the yarn. And then I'll uh, sew on the microphone. So we'll see how far this goes. And I will turn on this funny, funny TED Talk. I just want to thank you guys for hanging out with me tonight. I am a third shift worker, so this is always uh, fun trying to find new and inventive ways to stay up at night while my husband is snoring downstairs. <laughs> I can't sleep when he's home. I love him, but I can't sleep when he's home. Thank God we're on opposite shifts. But we had such a great night tonight. We really needed a date night just out and away. Okay. Getting there, getting there, getting there. I do have a stitch there. Okay. Um, starting the TED Talk. Eight years ago, I was haunted by an evil spirit. I was 25 at the time, and I was living in a tiny house behind someone else's house in Los Angeles. It was this guest house. It had kind of been dilapidated, not taken care of for a long time. And one night, I was sitting there, and I got this, this really spooky feeling. Kind of a feeling like you're being watched, but no one was there except my two dogs, and they were just chewing their feet. And I looked around, no one was there, and I thought, okay, this is just my imagination. But the feeling just kept getting worse, and I started to feel this, this pressure in my chest, sort of like the feeling when you get bad news, but it started to sink lower and lower, and almost hurt. And over the course of that week, this feeling got 
worse and worse. And I started to become convinced that something was there in my little guest house haunting me. And I started to hear these sounds, this whoosh kind of whisper, like something passing through me. And I called my best friend, Claire, and I said, I know this is going to sound crazy, but um, I think there's a ghost in my house. I need to get rid of it. And, uh, and she said, she's very open-minded, and she said, I don't think you're crazy. Um, I think you just need to do a cleansing ritual. Uh, so... Uh, get some sage and burn it and uh, tell it to go away. So I said, okay. And um, I went and I bought sage and I had never done this before. So set the sage on fire, um, waved it about and said, go away. This is my house. I live here. You don't live here. Uh, but the feeling stayed, nothing got better. And, um, and then I started to think, okay, well now this thing's probably just laughing at me because, uh, you know, it hasn't left and I probably just look like this impotent, powerless thing that couldn't get it to go away. And so every day I'd come home and you guys, this, this feeling got so bad that, I mean, I'm laughing at it now, but I would, I would sit there in bed and I, I would cry every night. Um, and the feeling on my chest got worse and worse. It was, it was physically painful. And um, I even went to a psychiatrist and um, tried to get her to prescribe me medicine. And she wouldn't just because I don't have schizophrenia. Okay. Um, and so, uh, so finally I got on the internet and I Googled hauntings. And I came upon this forum of ghost hunters, but these were a special kind of ghost hunters. They were skeptics. And so they believed that every case of ghosts that they had investigated so far had been explained away by science. And I was like, okay, smart guys, um, this is what's happening to me. And if you have an explanation for me, I would love to hear it. And one of them said, okay, um, have you heard of carbon monoxide poisoning? And I said, yeah, like, like gas poisoning. So carbon monoxide poisoning is when you have a gas leak leaking into your home. And uh, I looked it up and the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning include a pressure on your chest, <laughs> auditory hallucinations, whoosh, and an unexplained feeling of dread. So that night, I called the gas company. I said, I have an emergency. Um, need you to come out. Don't want to get into the story now, but I need you to come out. Uh, I came out. I said, I suspect a gas leak. Uh, they brought their carbon monoxide detector. And the man said, um, it's a really good thing that you called us tonight because you could have been dead very soon. 37% of Americans believe in haunted houses. And I wonder how many of them have been in one and how many of them have been in danger. So that haunting story has led me to my job. I'm an investigator and I'm an investigator in two senses. I'm an investigative journalist and I'm also an investigator of the claims of the paranormal and claims of the spiritual. And that means a few things. Um, sometimes that means that I'm pretending to need an exorcism so that I can get, uh, yes, that's right, so I can go to an exorcist and see if he's using gimmicks or psychological tricks to try to convince someone that they're possessed. Um, sometimes that means I'm going undercover in a fringe group, uh, which I report on for a, a podcast that I co-host. And I've done over 70 investigations like this with my co-host, Ross, and I would love to tell you that nine times out of ten, science wins, it saves the day, it's all explained. That's not true. The truth is, ten times out of ten, science wins, it saves the day. <laughs> I 
And that doesn't mean there's no such thing as a mystery. Of course there are mysteries. But a mystery is a mystery. It is not a ghost. Now, I believe there are two kinds of truth. And it's taken me a while to get to this place. Um, but I think this is right, so hear me out. I think there is outer truth and there's inner truth. So if you say to me, there was a man named Jesus and he once existed. That's outer truth, right? And we can go and we can look at the historical record. We can determine whether that seems to be true. And I would argue it does seem to be true. Um, if you say Jesus rose from the dead. Ooh, trickier. Um, I, uh, I, I would say, I would say that's an outer truth claim. Because he physically rose or he didn't. I'm not going to get into whether he rose or he didn't. But I would say that's an outer truth claim. It happened or it didn't happen. But if you say, I don't care whether he rose from the dead. It's symbolically important to me. And that metaphor is so meaningful, so purposeful to me. And I'm not going to try to persuade you of it. Now you've moved it from outer truth to inner truth, from science to art. And I think we have a tendency to not be clear about this, to try to move our inner truths to outer truths, or to not be fair about it to each other. And when people are telling us their inner truths, to try to make them defend them by outer truth standards. So I'm talking here about outer truth, about objective things. Um, and there was an objective reality in my haunted house, right? Now that I've told you about the gas leak, I doubt a single person here would be like, I still think there was a ghost too. Because as soon as we have these scientific explanations, we know to give up the ghost. We use these things as stop gaps for things that we can't explain. We don't believe them because of evidence. We believe them because of a lack of evidence. So there is a group in Los Angeles called the Independent Investigations Group, or the IIG, and they do great work. They'll give a $10,000 prize to anyone who can show, under scientific conditions, that they have a paranormal ability. No one's done it yet. Um, but they've had a couple of people who claim that they were clear audience, which means that they can hear voices um, either from the great beyond or they can read minds. And they had one person who was very sincere, who believed that he could, he could read minds. And, um, and a lot of these people, <laughs> that wasn't a laugh line, but okay. <laughs> um, a lot of these people uh, uh, really are sincere. And, and I believe this guy was, he really thought he had this power. So they set up a test with him, and this is the way it always works. The group says, okay, we have a protocol. We have a way to scientifically test this. Do you agree with it? The person says yes. Then they test it. It's very important that both sides agree. They did that. They tested him. And they said, okay, you know what? Um, you weren't able to predict what Lisa was thinking outside. You know, it matched up about the same as chance. It looks like you don't have the power. And that gave them the opportunity to compassionately sit down with him and have a very difficult discussion, which basically amounted to, hey, we know you're sincere. And what that means is you do hear something in your head. And that's a tough thing to face. Um, uh, but that day, that guy got to make the very difficult decision um, but really the life-changing decision about whether to go get help. Um, <laughs> I, but that really could be, that could be the first day of the rest of your life. Because when we challenge, when we challenge these beliefs, we're actually helping people to, to make these, these connections that maybe before seems like otherworldly explanations help draw us into reality and maybe change our lives for the better. Now, on the other hand, maybe one time it'll turn out to be true. Maybe we'll find out there are ghosts, and holy shit, it'll be the best thing. And every time I do one of these investigations, I still get so excited, and I'm like 75 into them, and still, I swear, on number 76, I'm gonna be like, this is the one! And I, I mean, maybe I'm just eternally optimistic, but I hope I never lose this hope. And 
I invite you to take the same attitude when people share their outer beliefs with you. When talking about testable claims, respect them enough to ask these good questions, challenge and see how you can examine them together. Because there's this idea that you can't respect a belief and still challenge it, but that's not true. And when we jiggle the lock, when we test the claim, we're saying, okay, I respect you. I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm going to test it out with you. Like, we've all had that experience where you're telling someone something, and they're like, oh, it's really interesting. Yeah. You know, you, you know you're being had, but when someone says, really? Huh. It sounds a little sketchy to me, but okay, I'm listening. You at least know you're being engaged, you're being respected. And that's the kind of attitude we should have with these claims. That's showing someone that you care what they're saying. That's, that's respect. <laughs> now, yes, most of these searches will come up em empty, but that's how all of science works. Every cure for cancer so far has not panned out, but we don't stop looking because, and for two reasons, because Number one, the answer matters. Whether it's looking at the afterlife or the paranormal or the cure for cancer, it all amounts to the same question. How long will we be here? And, and two, because looking for the truth, being open-minded and being willing to be wrong and to change your whole world view, it is awe-inspiring. I still get excited at ghost stories every single time. <laughs> I still consider that every group I join might be right, and I hope I never lose that hope. Let's all never lose that hope, because searching for what's out there helps us understand what's in here. And also, please have a carbon monoxide detector in your home. Thank you. That was just too cute, too funny. I like that. Okay, let's turn Ted off, and we are just about done. So, I am just weaving in my yarn. I'm debating right now whether or not I want to even start ripping this video, or if I want to just go and relax and watch my um, Miyazaki films because I want to see, um, I've seen it before, but I want to watch, um, uh, hold on one second, let me do this stitch. Sometimes I have a hard time talking and thinking at the same time. Okay. Okay, I think that that's woven in enough. So at this point, we can just, ah, beautiful. Okay, so now we have, we have jiggly proof. And I need to plug in my um, hot glue gun and I will meet you back here in just a few moments. And, um, I don't know how to say the movie. I think it's Arite, Arite, but that's the movie I think I'm going to watch after this is, uh, you were a good girl and you did a good job. <laughs>